good evening everybody and welcome to this pancreas 2020 an evidence based approach which is being organized by the indian pancreas club uh, indian pancreas club has been there for a very long time and you can see professor rakesh tandon's uh, photo one of the founding members of this uh, it was uh, been predominantly doing pancreatic uh, based uh, conferences uh, once a year uh, it's now been uh, had there's been a change in the leadership and i think uh, uh, dr pramod garg has taken a very active part he's now the secretary general and he's taken a very active part and of course we all know that pramod is one of the world's leading researcher in the area of pancreas and uh, with his um, enthusiasm we decided that the pancreas club should now have like master classes which are evidence based uh, i think uh, there's uh, pancreas is one of the area where you can have lot of evidence based stuff because of the literature is available so it is decided that especially for the younger gastroenterologists and those graduates we should have an evidence based uh, pancreatic uh, master classes uh, over the next uh, few weeks uh, i think uh, like to thank pramod profusely for organizing this and of course we have Uh, from very eminent speakers from different parts of the world speaking in this area i'm sure the audience would enjoy it and we'd like to get a feedback of uh, how it's uh, going on pramod thank you very much i think uh, you can start the conversation pramod you are muted uh good evening everyone thank you very much uh, professor reddy for uh, for this uh, introduction to this first webinar series in fact uh, we had planned uh, our annual conference of indian pancreas club this year in august in mumbai uh, but as you all know that most co most conferences have now gone virtual uh, including the last one that i attended was american pancreatic association which professor saloja organized so uh, we decide that we will start with this webinar series and hopefully next year we will have our uh, physical annual conference uh, in india which is going to be in association with international association of pancreatology as has been decided so um, first of all i'd like to thank all the uh, uh, chairpersons moderators and especially sudipta uh, for organizing this he has done really hard work uh, for uh, in organizing this uh, webinar series uh, this uh, webinar series we are dedicated uh, to the memory of professor rakesh tandon who as dr reddy pointed out was the founding member and president of the indian pancreas club uh he is no more with us but i'm sure his legacy in terms of uh, academics uh, research and education will continue for a long time uh with these words uh, we'll start the session and i hand over the mic to uh, professor asok chako who is going to moderate this session uh, dr chako please dr chako as you know has been the head of <clears throat> gastroenterology at uh, cmc velour and has been for all his life an active researcher Uh, trainer teacher and uh, and a very popular gastroenterologist uh, dr chako please thank you professor garg uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here to moderate this uh, first lecture first talk first uh, webinar of the ipc we have a very interesting session here and uh, we will go into the first session and the first talk in the first session is what initiates acute pancreatitis and the speaker is a very famous basic pancreatic scientist professor ashok saluja professor ashok saluja is the director silvester cancer center he is the vice chair department of surgery director pancreatic research group and the secretary general of the american pancreatic association i've had uh, uh, my dealings with dr saluja has been very friendly and good and one of my post docs uh, santosh spent 3 years at his center at minneapolis on to professor saluja to deliver his lecture may I just add that nothing moves in pancreas without him in the united states of america please thank you very much for joining in i am not uh, sure at all of that pramod but uh, but thank you i appreciate uh, dr chako uh, and dr reddy and and uh, dr girl thank you very much and thank you for inviting me 
for for this meeting let me see if i can uh, turn on uh, just one second please i need to see my zoom is my presentation Okay, sorry about that. So again, thanks again for organizing it. And I really have uh, uh, great memories of uh, participating in uh, Indian Pancreas Club. I think uh, the first meeting was in uh, um, the, when Dr. Leigh Tendon, a great, great uh, friend, mentor, colleague for, for many of us, and certainly for me, organized this meeting <laughs> in Delhi and then uh, again in uh, 2000, I think it was 11 when we had a combined meeting with IAP uh, and, and Indian Pancreas Club in Cochin. There was two really great meetings and I was really looking forward to come and join uh, to all of you in, in Mumbai this year, but unfortunately we cannot do it. So I hope that next year we will be able to do that. Um, so let's uh, start with uh, with some of my thoughts. And again, it's kind of a biased opinion uh, that what initiates uh, pancreatitis, acute pancreatitis. So disease burden for acute pancreatitis uh, is increasing all over the world. Whenever I look at the epidemiological data in the US, you can tell that that is increasing. I think we will have uh, this year, more than 250,000 hospitalization only in US. And, and it's really a lot more in China and Japan and India and everywhere else. And, and it really costs a lot of money uh, to treat it. And then pretty soon I'll tell you that there's really no treatment, but we spend billions and billions of dollars and a lot of suffering with, uh, with really no per se treatment. Um, so it's kind of a, I put this as my disclosure that, that you know, I've been doing this thing uh, since end of 1982, so I'm pretty old. Uh, so I've been doing this thing for 30 some years. And, and there are others who have done it long before me, but the, uh, unfortunately there is really nothing. There is no specific treatment drug which we can do for acute pancreatitis patients or chronic pancreatitis patients for that matter. So what are the issues? Why we, you know, obviously it's, it will be nice if we know what the pathophysiology, what the underlying mechanisms are, because the thought is that if we know the mechanism, then you can uh, work on uh, treating those or are finding some cures for these things. Problem with this thing is that, that it's very, very difficult to get human pancreatic tissue, uh, pancreas tissue to study that. During the disease initiation, that's where we really need to have access. It's certainly not available. All of us love our pancreas, so are our patients. So we don't want to give our pancreas, right? So, so, so it's, uh, it's not available. You cannot have it for some healthy pancreas. It's uh, very difficult nowadays that we can get a little bit of that from cadavers. But, but during disease initiation, is certainly is not available. During active injury and evolution into complications, which are the serious problem in pancreatitis, it's not available. It's available at the resolution of injury at end stage, but there, the relevance of that, and that also in very few patients who unfortunately don't make it, <clears throat> but there also, unfortunately, the relevance of that is not really much because by that time, that pancreas is of not much use. So that's why we really need, and, and you know, if we want to study, we have to have animal models. So all of us have announced most of the pathophysiology and most of the initiating events in pancreatitis has been studied in mice and rats and on. So, so when I mentioned that we really don't know 
or we don't have a treatment. It's not that people have not been working. It's been like 125 years back when Kyrie uh, in, in proposed that pancreatitis is a autodigestive disease in which, uh, uh, in which the pancreas, the, the organ itself injured by its own enzymes. Uh, because I, all of us know that pancreas is full of digestive enzymes. So those enzymes can digest the pancreas just like they can digest anything we eat. So although it was proposed uh, in 1896, I think almost the first times you know, we showed that indeed these enzymes are activated within SNR cells, within pancreas itself. I think it was about 20 years back when we did this study, when, when I was in uh, Boston, uh, that you can measure active trypsin during, you know, uh, cerulean induced pancreatitis. And so that kind of led some credence that that trypsin must be important. Although we still did not roll what the role of trypsin is in causing injury, and I'll come to that uh, in, in a couple of minutes. But, but they were certainly, uh, and then other studies proved that the trypsin indeed is activated during early stages of pancreatitis in animals. And then there was an anecdotal evidence that, that in patients also, uh, that you can see trypsin and active trypsin in pancreatic juice. Then the question became where why, where, and how this premature activation of enzymes takes place? Is it really in national cells or extra national cells within national cells? How and why it takes place? So, and I'm going to summarize what became what we call the traditional paradigm that trypsin is activated in the cell. This is a national cell. In national cell, trypsin is activated that cause auto digestion, and that auto digestion cause acute pancreatitis. And if you have a prolonged repeated episodes that can result in chronic pancreatitis, something all of us agree on this, that that's what, you know, kind of a basic paradigm is. That trypsin is really most important part of that. How do we, then question is, how do we prove that? Or what are the initiating events? How trypsin get activated? Well, whenever we have a pathological insult, in our animal models, it's most commonly cerulean, but there are other models. And, but in patients, it could be many different things, whether it's alcohol or uh, gallstones and idiopathic, you know, there are several other. Uh, so many of us have shown very clearly that early on, calcium goes up in the cell. It's, it's this, remember, this calcium is going up in the cytosol of the cells. And this high calcium then can result in the co-localization of lysosomes and zymos and granules. Zymos and granules are the one where digestive enzymes and lysosomes are the one which contain hydrolytic enzymes, which can chop up uh, the extra uh, our waste products in our cells. And then also I will come to a little later that, that calcium is also very involved in NF-kappa B activation. And NF-kappa B activation, as you know, is the hallmark of, uh, of inflammation. Then the next question is that how do these pathways contribute to pathogenesis and how do we prove them? Well, first thing is trypsin activation. So trypsin or trypsinogen, which is enzymes and granule, come in contact with lysosomal enzymes, cathepsin B, and that converts trypsinogen to trypsin. We and many other people now and the, the investigators have uh, shown this repeatedly that indeed trypsin can, trypsinogen can be converted to active trypsin by acathepsin B. So if you want to prove this, then you can either inhibit trypsinogen or inhibit cathepsin B and show that there's no trypsin formed in this. So that's what we did. To, to prove that trypsin is really important in pancreatitis, we made trypsin knockout mice. And in these knockout mice, you can see that trypsin is not activated. In wild type, when you induce pancreatitis with cerulean or any other uh, method, you get a lot of trypsin activation. Whereas in knockouts, there was no trypsin activation. And not only there was, cathepsin B 
if you inhibit cathepsin B, and, and, and you know, so Walter Halkan, Cal Marcus Lurch showed that, that indeed when you inhibit cathepsin B, same thing, there was no activation of trypsin. So that kind of proves that activation of trypsin, which is mediated by cathepsin B, is important in that. But all of that was in vitro. The next experiment, which I thought was, which I think is one of the more crucial one, is that we took these wild type and trypsin knockout mice and induced pancreatitis in vivo, not in vitro, but in vivo, and see what happens. As you can see, compared to wild type pancreatitis, trypsin salmon knockouts have less injury. And, and if you, and which is one of the hallmarks of pancreatitis is necrosis or apoptosis or cell death, whatever we, the way we look at it. So in wild type, there was significant injury. In knockout, there's less. But it's not, it's important that it's not completely gone. So, so that kind of suggests that there might be some other factors other than trypsin is also involved in initiating pancreatitis. So in the next experiment, we evaluated in a systemic inflammation, local and systemic inflammation. And one of the ways you can measure inflammation is look at uh, myelose peroxidase. It's an inflammatory enzyme and uh, it's involved in inflammation. It's a neutrophilic enzyme. You can see in wild type and Interestingly, in trypsin knockout mice, there was same extent of inflammation, not only in pancreas, but the systemic inflammation in lungs was also exactly same. Remember, I, I mentioned earlier that NF-kappa-B is the initiating event for inflammation. You can see here, both in wild type mice, where trypsin is activated during pancreatitis, similar amount of NF-kappa-B was activated in knockout mice also. And so all of these experiments tell us that the absence of trypsinogen, which prevents activation of trypsin, is significantly decrease the death of pancreatic cancer cells during pancreatitis. However, and it's equally important, that absence of trypsinogen does not affect inflammatory response in acute pancreatitis. Activation of NF-kappa-B is independent of trypsinogen activation. For a long while, there was a controversy that is NF-kappa-B dependent upon active trypsin. So, so, so these facts suggest that, that, that for initiating pancreatitis, not only active trypsin is needed, premature activation of trypsin is needed, but also there's an independent pathway for causing inflammatory response. So next question was, so we have active trypsin in pancreatitis, in SNR cells. So how does that, how does that cause SNR cell death? So that's the work uh, which was done, which I'm not gonna show you for lack of time. There was the work done, uh, again, that brings the memories of uh, Dr. Rakesh Tandon. And, and when I, I think in one of my trips uh, to, to India, I, I met Dr. Tandon, which I had a pleasure of meeting every time I went to India or he came to US, we used to meet. And he said, well, I have a very smart uh, DM fellow in, in my group, and, and, but he would like to be a really a pancreatologist and do some basic research. Can he join your group? And so I met uh, in Delhi, uh, uh, Rup Jyoti uh, and, and and he joined our group, and and the work uh, uh, and then just amazing guy worked very hard, spent only about a year in the lab, but but he showed that how trypsin causes cell death. Unfortunately, I'm not going to show you data data for that, but I'm going to explain to you what Rup Jyoti's work indicated in in this uh, cartoon. So. Any insult which causes pancreatitis, I showed you that it causes calcium increase, increase NF-kappa-B, cause co-localization. And in this co-localization, which has lysosomes, zymosomes, and that results in active trypsin. But once this trypsin is activated in these co-localized organelles, these organelles break. And what, what Rup Jyoti, who is now in Hyderabad with Dr. Reddy, uh, when, when, when that leaks uh, to the cytosol. So this is the cytosol, the, this trypsin 
comes out, the active trypsin, and everything else from this. So it's not only active trypsin, active trypsin causes breakage of these organelles, but then it leaks. And what it leaks is the cathepsin B also. So what we believe is, it's really the cathepsin B in the cytosol, which cause both SNR cell death and by necrosis, apoptosis, all kind of pathways. And once the cells are dying, that's what we call local injury or initial pancreatitis, which is a milder injury at that stage. However, at the same time, or similar time, this insult, which cause calcium rise and activation of uh, uh, PKC results in NF-kappa B activation, which of course makes a lot of cytokines, chemokines, which recruits inflammatory cells in, in the injured area. And these, then, then this process is, these inflammatory cells cause more and this pathway, the, this cycle becomes worse and worse. And that's what results, what we call later stages of injury. Recent work shows that, that these macrophages here also can activate more trypsinogen to trypsin, and, and that's from Marcus Lurch and Julia Meyerly, uh, and, and that cause worse and worse pancreatitis. But suffice to say that that results in systemic injury, lung injury, and, and all kinds of things, and that's where it becomes very serious, uh, uh, severe acute pancreatitis. I'm going to show you a little bit that, uh, that both SNR cells, when they are injured, and when uh, uh, and, and the inflammatory cells can release extracellular ATP, and this ATP can cause a lot of inflammation. I think towards the end, I have a couple of slides on that. So all of this ends up what we call later stages of pancreatitis and more inflammation. I, I want to show you a couple of slides in calcium because that's intracellular calcium because that's where a lot of work is being done right now. And, and hopefully some of that will be successful in clinical trials. So what we showed about 20 years back that indeed calcium is important because if you chelate calcium <clears throat> with BAPTA, which is an intracellular chelate, that is whenever it's a sponge, it gets into cytosol and chelate all the calcium so that calcium gets very, very low in the cells and that prevents trypsin activation and cell death. So, we showed that, then I think uh, Marcus Lurch later on showed the same kind of a thing. And he has an interesting twist to that, that he says, if you, if you give magnesium to mice in this experiment, and that prevent entry of calcium, remember magnesium and calcium have same entry pathways into cell, so that if you give a lot of magnesium, that, that will prevent calcium entry and decrease severity of pancreatitis. And so, so in Germany and in Europe, they are doing this trial where they give patients a lot of magnesium. And I think uh, they should have some results in the next year or two on that, that if this works. Uh, there are other people who have done, uh, my good friend Shmuel Mualam in, in, uh, uh, in NIH has shown that again, if you inhibit calcium entry to SNR cells, that decreases severity of pancreatitis. They had a very nice paper in gastroenterology. Uh, so all of these results, and, and Steve Pandol is very involved and in that he has set up a company now where they are going to test some of these calcium entry inhibitors and see if that prevents pancreatitis. Very quickly, I'm going to sell some of the other intra-SNR cell events. So Anna Gokowaskia in Los Angeles have shown that, that some of the early events, which are again caused by calcium overload, is the mitochondrial injury, which can result in impaired autophagy, and if they inhibit impaired autophagy with, with these inhibitor trellos, that decreases the severity of uh, pancreatitis. So that's uh, another way of controlling pancreatic. See, you can see that this is the arginine induced pancreatitis, very bad. And you give this uh, uh, autophagy inhibitor trellos, and then you can see the injury is much less. Uh, so, so Suhail Hussain. Uh, again, now he just moved to Stanford and he's chief of pediat uh, pediatric gastroenterology there, uh, is very active in studying calcium neuron. Calcium neuron is a calcium activated uh, uh, phosphatase and, and this phosphatase calcium neuron then results in activation of T cell inflammation. And he shows that during pancreatitis, this calcium neuron is activated compared to normal basal values. And then if you inhibit calcium neuron 
with FK505 or, or cyclosporin 8, these are the known inhibitors, the injury is much less with, the, with his model uh, of uh, pancreatitis. Uh, so some of our recent work, we are looking at another very interesting enzyme, ADAM1017. ADAM1017 is, is a metalloproteinase and, and its function is basically, it releases TNF, uh, solubility and, and IL6 receptors, which are bound to membranes and it chop off them with this enzyme for, for ADAM17 is TNF alpha converting enzyme or TAS. Uh, suffice to say that, that these ADAM17 and ADAM10, these are enzymes which causes release of uh, uh, inflammatory mediators, TNF alpha and IL6 into circulation and then can cause systemic injury. So, but what we are showing is that if we inhibit this and we have some good inhibitors for ADAM10 and 17, that in a very established model of pancreatitis, one of the problem in our field is that most of the time, the studies which are done is prophylactic. Here, we induce pancreatitis in mice for nine hours and they have full-blown pancreatitis. Then we gave this inhibitor for ADAM10 and 17. And then next day, we evaluated the severity of pancreatitis in an established model. And, and I'm just going to show you a couple of slides on this because this paper is uh, under review right now or will be under review very soon. You can see that acute pancreatitis uh, the Sudian model, and then you can see when you give ADAM1070 inhibitor, the injury is less. Same thing is less neutrophils, and we can see less inflammation, edema, all of these uh, necrosis. Total scores are much less in that uh, when you give ADAM1070 in that. Same thing happen if you look at as expected TNF alpha, IL6, which are not now in circulation, their levels were also less. All of that proves that that there is a potential that, that ADAM1017 inhibitors could have a significant effect in therapeutic setting, not in prophylactic settings, which, you know, obviously when you have a prophylactic setting, which we need to try first, but that doesn't really help you guys. The last couple of slides, I'm going to show you the effect of extracellular ATP. So this is the serum level of ATP when you induce pancreatitis. And this is in more severe form of acute pancreatitis in two days, you can see there's a lot of ATP in circulation at that time. And if we inhibit this ATP, and apolyse is an enzyme which will chop off ATP and, and, and decrease that, you can see the inflammatory markers, IL-6, TNF alpha, all of that are decreased and so is the systemic injury inflammation. This is the lung inflammation. You can see that there are much less neutrophils in lung when we block ATP in the circulation. I think this is probably my last uh, data slide. This is a very interesting work which is being done by uh, Dr. Vijay Singh, who is a professor in Mayo Clinic in, in Scottsdale. And, and Vijay is now becoming really his, his interest is uh, uh, to study uh, role of lipids uh, and, and in, in pancreatitis. So, so what he's showing is that if you inhibit lipase, <clears throat> this is the enzyme which uh, hydrolyzes <clears throat> triglycerides and, and lipids in, in pancreas, uh, you can see that, and this is a very, very severe model of pancreatitis, uh, where the mice will die in about three, four days. You can see that if you don't do anything, the mice dies three days. If you give Orolistat, which is a known uh, inhibitor of lipase, there was a uh, protection. And I think their group has developed a new inhibitor, which is still kind of in, in the process and they call it 767. And that really is very, very effective and totally prevent that. Uh, so that's Vijay's work, and actually he has an interesting article on effect of, uh, uh, you know, he's a pancreatitis guy, but but he has a publication in gastroenterology on COVID very recently, I think in the last couple of months. So you might want to look at that. That's kind of an interesting work on role of um, serum albumin and calcium, how that affect uh, <clears throat> uh, pancreatic uh, lipids or cir circulating lipids and, and ends up in COVID, because if you really think of that, the injury with COVID is more of a lung injury, lung fibrosis, 
lung inflammation, which is very, very similar to what we find in pancreatitis. So it's a very good connection in two, and, and Vijay is doing really good work on that. So, so I have shown you that, that and some of the selective data, there's a lot more data where we have made a lot of progress, I think, in finding the initiating events in pancreatitis. However, the clinical progress has lagged far behind than experimental work. I think some of the reasons for that are really, you know, very logical, very obvious that most of the time when you get your patients, they have a late presentations. Unlike our patients, mice and rats, they are very controlled. So we can study them. It's very difficult to study in patients because they already have a very well established uh, studies. The other problem with the experimental pancreatitis is that, that we have focused mostly on early events, whereas we need to really go after the late events also, because that's where you get your patients. And, and I think that's where the problem is. We really have incomplete understanding of late, late events, and we need to work more on that. Either which way we cut, we really need a lot more work, and we need to do something about finding some treatment, some cure, some drugs for pancreatitis. I mean, pancreatic cancer is much worse disease, but we still have some, at least when a patient comes in, you can give them gemcitabine, abraxane, and, and folchlorinox, and, and hopefully menalide. So, so there, are, there are a lot of different possibilities. Whereas for a patient with pancreatitis, although you guys are experts, but to best of my knowledge, all you do is what uh, Dr. Garg is going to tell us in the next talk about fluids. Fluids, whether you have lactate or whether you have not lactate, you have, you have three liters or four liters. We are really, really still at very, very basic stage there. So what we need is really more research and so that we can find something for our patients. With that, I really want to thank all of you for listening to me, giving me the opportunity to present. And, and all of this work is done by very talented people in our group. And I mentioned about Vijay Singh, who worked with us for many years. And same is Rup Jyoti, Marcus, Julia, Dr. Vickers, and Miklas. These are some of my collaborators, uh, along with Dr. Gurg in India and, and many other people. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor uh, Saluja, for that really fascinating lecture on the pathogenesis of uh, acute pancreatitis. I have uh, one or two questions, very basic stuff. Uh, from what I gathered from your lecture, calcium was the primary increased calcium intracellular. It can both lead to co-localization of trypsin and uh, catepsin, leading on to cell damage, as well as NF-kappa B, which uh, then goes on to inflammatory, systemic inflammatory response. My question is, uh, what determines it? Why do some people have only local injury? Others have quite bad systemic injury. Is there something that triggers into one side or the other or both sides? Uh, is there anything that can explain that? Um, Chako, very, very interesting question. Uh, I, I really think that uh, the initiating events are probably same in, in all patients. That activation of trypsin, which by itself causes you know, milder local injury, is the inflammation which does that. But then inflammation is a very, very complex issue. That what kind of inflammation you get, what you get there. And, and that inflammation, which we still quite don't understand whether it's T-cell mediated, macrophages, neutrophils, on and on. And, and how those are activated, that probably cause results in, in whether we will have more multi-organ failure or not and so on. And other comorbidities in patients obviously you know, adds to it. So, so those are the things which we still need to understand. Does genetics play a role in this? Uh, in, on... Yeah, in, in some patients, yes, because, you know, there's a very elegant work that, that uh, PRSS1, uh, you know, mutations and, and many other mutations, which since 95, 96, a lot of mutations have been studied, and that does cause pancreatitis, or that 
that could be an event by itself they are not but again with with some uh, you know uh, other events happening some other uh, infections happening that can results in that can affect but but that's like maybe you know definitely less than 5% patients we have a question in the chat box from dr jenty what is the difference in pathogenesis in acute pancreatitis vis-a-vis acute and chronic pancreatitis uh again a good question uh so so what what we think by and large is that the initial event in immune and chronic pancreatitis starts with acute pancreatitis so when you have mul- and that's really true clinically i think uh, you know vast majority of your patients have recurring attacks of uh, acute pancreatitis which converts into chronic pancreatitis so so we think that the initiating events are probably very very similar in two uh although we get a lot more uh, fibrosis in in chronic pancreatitis than in um, acute pancreatitis the question is are there any biomarkers to predict acute severe pancreatitis from your studies that's what we call million dollar question right so so i wish we know that uh, i mean that's what the you know the whole world is looking or our field is looking that that what can we tell early on whether your patient who has a mild pancreatitis will end up with the severe disease which can kill him and put him in icu and uh, unfortunately there's nothing there there are lots and lots of work going on everyone comes up with something or the other but nothing much for example yeah. we think the AT, atp be might one of them markers and you know we have looked at all kind of tnf alpha il6 all of these things have been studied but there's really nothing much we have a last question from uh, deepak gunjan why why does not an anti inflammatory agents i think i guess he says he means nsaids they are not successful in treating systemic inflammation good question problem is that there are so many inflammatory pathways there are so many different inflammatory mediators you you can inhibit some for example there is a trial going on or it was where you block tnf alpha you block tnf alpha there is a compensatory inflammatory response by others so the question is how do you totally block inflammation and i don't think and 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 it's not good to block total inflammation anyway because inflammation does have a very positive roles also we need inflammation that's why whoever created us evolution good god lord shiva or whoever you have to put, put that inflammation pathway there and so we need that so we cannot totally block it so it's a balance and it has been very very difficult to control that balance so any monotherapy any something which will inhibit and remember the tnf alpha trial has already failed and then then you know they are so it's not it's it's a difficult not to crack thank you very much uh, professor saluja for that exciting talk and thank you, uh, thank you very much and we'll go on on to dr jayanti to introduce the next speaker and carry on thank you dr saluja for the wonderful basic concepts on acute pathogenesis of acute pancreatitis and moving on from the basic sciences we now move on to the clinical aspect and to speak about this we have professor ramod gar professor of gastroenterology from the all india institute of medical sciences well known for his major contributions in the field of pancreatology in india as well as in the international field and he will be speaking to us on the fluid management as well as the pain management in acute pancreatitis I've heard Dr. Pramod Gar speak on this on several occasions, but each time I always gather new points. So I'm going to gather some more new points from you, sir, today. Over to you, Dr. Gar. Uh, thank you, Professor Jayanti, for this kind introduction. Uh, we have actually uh, made the program in a, in such a manner that as the patient comes in uh, to a hospital, how do we manage him uh, uh, sequentially from starting from day one onwards till. is discharged so the concerns in the first week of illness include 
that most of the patients are hospitalized. They need analgesics for the abdominal pain, which of course is their major presenting symptom. We need to give them fluids because by and large, most patients are not taking anything orally. And it's a general advice to uh, stop giving them anything orally. Uh, sometimes these patients are treated with antibiotics, but now the consensus has emerged that antibiotics, prophylactic antibiotics have no major role, though we are not discussing that. Uh, the next major point is regarding nutrition, and we are going to have a talk on nutrition. And then in the first week of illness, we have in patients with gallstone pancreatitis an issue whether they need endoscopic intervention with ERCP or not, and we are going to have a talk uh, by Dr. Reddy on that. And in the subsequent webinar, we move on to the next, uh, uh, next uh, stage of the disease where you have further complications and we see how we manage them. So I'm going to discuss only analgesia and IV fluids in, the, in my talk. For analgesia, we have two choices, either non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or opiates. Uh, the concerns with both of these is regarding their safety profile. NSAIDs may cause GI bleeding and may also sometimes result in renal failure. And both these problems are seen in patients with acute pancreatitis even without uh, giving NSAIDs. So NSAIDs might exacerbate these two. <clears throat> with opioids, again, there are issues with paralytic ileus and respiratory depression. Again, most of these patients who have moderate to severe pancreatitis have some kind of respiratory problems in the beginning. Now, there is not much data about analgesia in patients with, with acute pancreatitis. Uh, my uh, colleague, Dr. Soumya Jagannathan, uh, who is now an assistant professor, conducted this randomized trial of comparing an NSAID with <clears throat> an opioid that is pentazosine or fortwin, which is a common opiate analgesic used. And uh, he compared pentazosine, with, which is a kappa opioid agonist with daclofenac uh, for pain control. The study design was that all consecutive patients with acute pancreatitis was, were uh, included in this study and they were <coughs> randomized to receive either diclofenac 75 milligram or pentazosine 30 milligram eight hourly. <coughs> in addition, we provided fentanyl as rescue analgesia <coughs> excuse me, through a patient controlled analgesia pump. Now, if you look at the efficacy outcomes, uh, the total dose of uh, rescue analgesia required was much less in the pentazosine group. Pain-free period was longer in the pentazosine group and the number of demands for rescue analgesia was also significantly less. <clears throat> we have recently did a systematic review. Again, Soumya has done this. Looking at uh, various trials which have compared uh, opioids with another opioid or opioid with another analgesic. So uh, multiple trials have been done, uh, including pethidine, buprenorphine, erectile neuromethacine, pentazosine with procaine, morphine with metamizole, tramadol with cetamol. And this last trial is from PGI Chandigarh. This is comparing diclofenac with tramadol. And uh, <clears throat> various studies have assessed the uh, pain at different intervals as uh, short as 30 minutes and as long as seven days. And they have given rescue analgesia again with different uh, uh, drugs. Uh, not much difference was found in any of these trials. Uh, one trial done in 2004 showed again pentazosine that is 14 was better than procaine. We also found pentazosine to be better than, than diclofenac. Uh, but the problem with these trials were there were small sample size, there was heterogeneity, and the, the assessment of pain was not uh, objective. It was more subjective and at different uh, point in time. <clears throat> so overall, there is not much data about uh, which analgesic is the best. Uh, in general though, opioids are preferred as has been shown in some of these studies. One thing that I would highlight is that patient controlled analgesia pump is a very useful uh, way of providing rescue analgesia in these patients and we now routinely use this uh, for effective uh, pain relief. The second issue that I'm gonna discuss is about uh, IV fluids in patients with acute pancreatitis. 
And this is important in the first 48 to 72 hours of the illness. Beyond that, generally, uh, fluid therapy should be guided by the output of the patient, urine output and other outputs. So it is, it is most important in the first 48 to 72 hours. <clears throat> the issues here are what is the usual fluid deficit in acute pancreatitis? What should be the rate and type of fluid replacement? And how do we guide fluid therapy in these patients? Now, if you go back 1974, Ranson, and he's this famous Ranson of the Ranson criteria, he showed that fluid loss at 48 hours is 3.7 liters and 5.6 liters in mild and severe acute pancreatitis. Uh, more recently, uh, uh, about five years ago, G. Madaria from Spain uh, uh, showed that the median fluid loss was 3.2 liters in patients with acute pancreatitis, and the predictors of fluid loss was younger age, alcohol, glucose, and SIRS. The question is when we talk about fluid therapy, how aggressive should we? So again, there is a problem here because uh, in a meta-analysis of nine studies which reported fluid infusion, aggressive group was defined as those who received 4.5 liters of fluid in the first 24 hours. And non-aggressive was those who received 3.5 liters in the first 24 hours. The fluid which was given varied from 15 to 20 ml per kg bolus followed by 1.3 to 3 ml per kg per hour. So there was a lot of difference in, in, in different studies. Now, if you look at the results, <clears throat> aggressive versus non-aggressive, four studies, which are observational studies, favor aggressive fluid therapy. And they showed that if there is hemo concentration, the first 24 hours, there is more necrosis. If you give less fluid, there is more chances of SIRS, organ failure, and mortality. Now, more recent studies, which include RCTs, aggressive fluid resuscitation was actually shown to worsen organ failure, intra-abdominal hypertension, and need for ICU care, and even mortality. One of the trials from China actually showed higher mortality if patients were given rapid fluid. The only problem with that trial was that they decreased hematocrit rapidly from about 44, 45, to 36. So there was very rapid uh, fluid uh, volume expansion. <clears throat> the next issue is which fluid to be given. Now, uh, one study which was published uh, uh, many years ago uh, compared crystalloids, normal saline versus Ringer lactate. Uh, this was a randomized trial of 40 patients. Uh, this trial was actually looking at the rate of infusion, whether there is a difference in the outcome with different rates of infusion of fluid. But what it found was that uh, there was no difference with regard to the rate of infusion, but overall Ringer lactate infusion was found to be better than normal saline. And it was presumed that normal saline may lead to hyperchloremic acidosis, which could be one of the reasons why it may not be that good for patients with acute pancreatitis. Now, this early this month, 3rd of November, uh, Gastroenterology uh, published this uh, study from USA, uh, where again, the authors have compared lactate ringers with, with normal saline in mild acute pancreatitis, a randomized trial um, published uh, uh, early this, this week. Uh, the authors randomized 121 patients with mild acute pancreatitis. It was a randomized trial comparing ringer lactate versus normal saline. The volume of fluid infused was 10 ml per kg bolus, followed by 3 ml per kg per hour. So that roughly means about 4.5 to 5 liters of fluid in 24 hours. And the primary outcome was a reduction in SIRS in these patients, uh, comparing these two types of fluid. But the authors found no difference between ringer lactate and normal saline with regard to the primary outcome, that is reduction in SIRS. However, they did find that admission to ICU was significantly lower in patients who were given ringer lactate suggesting that ringer lactate might be useful. But it was, uh, it was suggested that it's basically it's a hypothesis generating finding and one would require a, a different study to find out if ringer lactate results in benefit other than reduction in SIRS or severity of illness. <clears throat> now, another study which was published this month uh, in pancreas, and this is an observational study from China where they studied 317 patients with acute pancreatitis. And they found that organ failure increased significantly with increased fluid output, in, fluid intake. 
Now, from zero to 12 hours, if there is increased fluid intake, the chances of developing organ failure is higher. Similarly, at 36 to 48 hours again, if patients were given more fluid, they had more chances of developing organ failure. Now, also they showed that in hospital mortality also increased if patients were given more fluid at 24 to 36 hours. So this is again a caution, this study published this month, that if patients with acute pancreatitis are given higher amount of fluid, they may develop more problems. So to say that every patient will need five to six liters of fluid is actually uh, uh, exaggeration. I think most patients do not require that. How do we monitor this? So most people will say goal-directed therapy and what are our goals in these patients? Mean arterial pressure about 70 millimeter of mercury, hematocrit should be around 40, and we need a minimum output of 0.5 to 1 ml per, per minute uh, in terms of uh, urine output. How do we monitor this? A CEP is actually not a good guide, especially for patients who are on ventilator and it is almost given up. Stroke volume and arterial pressure waveform are good, but they require invasive monitoring. For non-invasive, I would suggest that IVC diameter is a very good marker and so is a lung ultrasound. Now, most ICUs nowadays have this lung ultrasound, uh, which is done to find out if there is uh, fluid overload and measuring the IVC diameter in the ICU by gastroenterology residents or intensive care residents is not difficult, it is easy. In fact, you don't need an ultrasonologist or a radiologist to do that. And this is a very good guide. Similarly, lung ultrasound can be easily done by residents at the bedside to look at B lines, which suggest uh, that there is fluid overload in these patients. <clears throat> so what is the overall recommendation about fluid therapy in these patients? There is variability in practice guidelines. Uh, inter inter International Association of Pancreatology has different guidelines. American College of Gastroenterology has different guidelines, but I would suggest that it's reasonable to, to recommend three to four liters of ringer lactate in the first 24 hours. And again, it should depend on fluid assessment and severity of acute pancreatitis. We should be cautious in giving more fluids in elderly people, those who have cardiopulmonary comorbidities, intra-abdominal hypertension, and renal failure. Beyond these, the intake should be, as I said, as per the hour. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to summarize by saying that for providing good pain relief, uh, opioids seem to be better than uh, NSAIDs. Uh, we must provide adequate analgesia. And as I said, patient control analgesia through a pump is a very good addition to your uh, treatment uh, options. In terms of IV fluids, we must realize that there is no real loss, but it's a sequestration of fluid. So be cautious about going fluids. Uh, Adequate but not overzealous fluid. So three to four liters of fluid a day is, is enough. And we are now uh, conducting a randomized trial about how much fluid should be given. Should it be guided by intravascular fluid volume or not? More importantly, we should have checkpoints at every six to eight hours to see if there is fluid overload or not. We just can't write the orders in the sister's book and say, give four liters of fluid have, uh, in 24 hours. We have to have checkpoints. And overall, ringer lactate seems to be better than uh, normal saline. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Pramod. Uh, I think uh, Jayanti is there. I think Jayanti got her connection uh, um, cancelled. I think there is some problem with her connection. So, Pramod, it was a wonderful talk. And uh, it was very basic as well as very informative. And you have touched <coughs> about all the latest uh, uh, or the current uh, literature as well. See, there, there are certain issues that I just want to raise that at the presentation of a patient with acute pancreatitis and the patient is quite sick and the patient has got a abnormal renal function. How do you decide on your uh, fluid therapy? Are you not bothered so, about the output <clears throat> at that time? Or? So I think this is a very important point. Now let's understand that those patients who have say diarrhea, they actually lose fluid. There is loss of fluid. So we need to really supplement good amount of fluid. In patients with acute pancreatitis, there is no loss of fluid. Whatever fluid is going out of the circulation is going to the interstitial space. So what happens if someone has renal dysfunction at the presentation? We need to understand it is pre-renal or it is the beginning of uh, organ dysfunction. And often it is very difficult to determine that. What is generally suggested is 
that in the first 24 hours when a patient comes in, we need to really give adequate fluid. So a 10 to 20 ml per kg bolus of fluid followed by 1.5 to 2 ml per kg for the next 24 hours is a reasonably good option. That means you are giving anywhere from three to four or five liters of fluid. Now, having said that, we need to really find out at eight hours, 16 hours, are there signs of overload? Is the patient producing enough urine or not? If not, or if there is fluid overload, we need to decrease our, our fluid uh, rate of infusion. Thank you, Pramod. And uh, another, another question is that, uh, does the severity of pancreatitis decide the type and quantity of fluid? Because in none of the studies, it is said that mild pancreatitis, they decided to give found that RL is slightly better, but basically there's no difference between the normal saline and linear lactage. And suppose the patient is in a severe situation, the patient directly goes to the ICU because the patient is so sick, needs ventilation. And in that case, do you have any difference in selection of fluid depending upon the severity? So unfortunately, we don't have data with regard to a mild or severe pancreatitis and the type of fluid, whatever data I've shown, whatever studies are available are in predominantly mild acute pancreatitis. I think type of fluid probably would be similar in even severe pancreatitis. But what is important is that in severe patients who are, as you're saying, going to ICU, have respiratory failure or renal failure, we have to be very cautious about giving fluids. More fluid will actually result in more hypoxia and may result in more uh, problems rather than benefit. So the uh, amount has to be very judiciously given in them. Because you know, most of the practitioners are really confused. You know, one, one set of people say that <clears throat> you hydrate this patient very well. Another said that the over hydration is leading to a dangerous thing. So the, people are really concerned about what is the best monitoring device. Because as you said, we have taken away uh, the central venous pressure without blood pressure may not be adequate and to monitor. And is there, because when you, that, that the commonest uh, test, the best test according to this intra IVC uh, dilatation, IVC monitoring with the ultrasound. The biggest problem with this is actually if you have a patient with a distended abdomen, patient is quite sick and patient has no avenue to look for the ultrasound uh, or IVC by the ultrasound. You know that sometimes the bowel is so much distant. So what would be your uh, next recommendation on that? So if the patient is really sick, I think he should be in a good ICU. And today, most ICUs have invasive pressure monitoring facility, intra-arterial. So I think nobody should say that I'm treating a patient with severe pancreatitis, but I don't have facilities. I think the patient should not be treated in a facility where you don't have this monitoring device. That's number one. Number two, I would say lung ultrasound has today proved to be a very important bedside test, and it should be available in all ICUs. In fact, in in all ICUs, they do a lung ultrasound for patients with sepsis, patients on, on pneumonia, patients with other problems. And I, we have found very good results uh, in patients with acute pancreatitis also to judge whether there is a development of fluid overload or not. In that case, you know, how frequently do a, a lung ultrasound? <clears throat> do you do uh, three times a day? No, no, no. So overall, it's a it's a basket that you are saying. You will see the blood pressure, the the urine output, the 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 heart rate, the amount of fluid given, amount of output is there. And then depending on whether you're feeling there is a, an, an obviously a chest auscultation. So we do lung ultrasound depending on the patient's condition. Once a day, twice a day, but not necessarily at 88 eight hours. That is not required. No, Dr. Randy, is there Randy, please take your, your back. Uh, I, I could not hear most of the talk. You can just, Dr. Roop Jyoti has a question. You can just take up that question. So uh, Roop has asked, uh, what duration of after symptom onset is goal-directed mm -hmm. aggressive therapy effective? So again, I mean, it depends. So in mild pancreatitis, there is really no problem. What are amount of fluid you give, it is okay. But in severe, we don't know. And this goal-directed aggressive therapy, which was initially <clears throat> popularized for patients with sepsis, uh, is something which is now inbuilt in all ICUs. For every patient who is in ICU, you need a mean arterial pressure of about 70. You need 0.5 to 1 ml of urine output. <clears throat> so this is something that you have to continue to achieve over, over days and weeks. But aggressive therapy in terms of fluid hasn't really been shown to benefit patients with acute pancreatitis. Uh, Pramod, there was a question. Uh, now, any role yeah. for the 
uh, adding uh, magnesium into the fluid uh, because that can uh, actually reduce the calcium uh, uh, in entry into the cells. And is there any role for using magnesium containing? So, so, so I think about Professor Saluja has very elegantly shown that magnesium might be effective. And I know there is a randomized trial in Europe uh, by Marcus Lurch and, and his, his team. Uh, it is possible, but we need to have data. We need to have a trial to show magnesium might be effective. Uh, another question Dr. Saluja has put in is that in animal models, morphine increases the severity of pancreatitis by probably altering the gut permeability. And uh, he had actually a paper on that in, <clears throat> in, in gut, if I remember correctly. So morphine is a mu, or mu receptor agonist. And uh, it has been shown that it might increase severity of pancreatitis. And that is why uh, we, we wanted to avoid it when we conducted this trial. Pentazocene, by the way, is a kappa uh, receptor agonist. And partially, it also inhibits mu receptor. So that's why we think it might be safer. Uh, Pramod, just one question to you. Yes, uh, in case one needs uh, prolonged analgesia because of pain continuing, uh, what about epidurals? Is it safer than giving morphine or opiates for longer periods? So that's a very good question. So it's possible that epidural analgesia might be might be effective. And uh, the only issue is that uh, whether you have that available in the in the emergency de uh, department or not. But certainly in a patient who is in ICU and continues to have pain, epidural analgesia might be might be a good option. We are soon going to conduct a RCT comparing a nerve block with, with analgesic in the emergency setting. So I think that's a good question. I have one more comment, uh, Pramod. Uh, you know that uh, morphine can actually produce uh, ambulatory spasm, you know, and is that responsible partly for the uh, non-relief of uh, pain? No, 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 uh, maybe a severity of aggravating the severity of pancreatitis. Yeah, maybe, maybe in patients with gallstone pancreatitis, that may be one of the, uh, one of the problems. So sure, that's possible. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Dr. Thank Prabhu, you. for a wonderful talk. I request Dr. Matthew to take over and introduce the next speaker. I think the next talk is on uh, nutritional therapy in acute pancreatitis. We have uh, Professor Anup Zaraya. He's the HOD of gastroenterology at Omni Institute of Medical Sciences. And uh, he's a good friend of mine. And uh, <laughs> actually, when I was doing my uh, DM elective and uh, actually I had the opportunity to be with him and was so friendly and kind to me and uh, so he's going to tell us on the nutritional aspect as, as we have heard that uh, as we take the journey of acute pain days coming in the casualty we have patient with pain and uh, then I, uh, IV fluid therapy then the next question comes is the nutrition so that's actually there were controversies initially and now I think there's a lot of studies coming up and uh, Professor Anup Saraya we are all eager to listen from you. What is the current status of nutritional recommendation for nutritional therapy, nutrition in patients with acute pancreatitis? Dr. Anup Sadai. Thank you, Dr. Matthew, for the introduction and I'll be discussing nutrition in acute pancreatitis. Like any other infection, sepsis or injury, as you know, there are certain phases, acute phase where catabolism is more, followed that is known as F phase and then a flow phase where if catabolism continues, patient deteriorates and if anabolism takes over, then patient recovers. So metabolism in, in acute pancreatitis is almost the same, there is increased protein catabolism, inability of exogenous glucose to inhibit gluconeogenesis, increased energy expenditure, increased insulin resistance, and increased dependence on fatty acid oxidation for energy. As far as intestinal barrier function is concerned, there is a defect in intestinal barrier function due to ischemia reperfusion injury, there may be immune deficiency state, and there is transmigration of that bacteria and bacterial overgrowth as well. What happens in acute pancreatitis? There is pancreatic inflammation, and then there is edema and hypovolemia, which leads to splanchanic vasoconstriction, 
leading to ischemia and then ischemia reperfusion injury, which leads to release of cytokines and neutrophils, which are primed. Then there is breach in intestinal barrier function. And so there may be chances of transmigration of gut bacteria and endotoxins. When these bacteria reaches to infected necrosis, means when they reaches to the necrotic tissue, then they cause infected necrosis. So what actually happens that there is, when there is a nutrition deprivation that leads to atrophy of cult, gut inflammatory protein expression is altered, loss of barrier function, and that leads to transmigration, sepsis, and organ failure. So this, I am sharing our own data. In fact, this is unpublished data till date. What changes we have observed in, in the intestine in cases of acute pancreatitis, the expression of tight junction protein, especially ZO1, Claudin-2, Claudin-4 is altered. There are ultrastructural changes. On electron microscopy, we could see uh, the changes in the, in the channel size, mitochondria, and desmosomes. Then as far as functional change in, is concerned, an LM ratio is altered, that means permeability is altered. Intestinal fatty acid binding protein, which is an indicator of gut with dysfunction, this is also increased in acute pancreatitis. Translocation, we could see by seeing 16 as RNA level. Endotoxemia, we have assessed in the serum. And then we have also seen permeability markers. So what happens after enteral nutrition, what we have observed that tight junction protein expression stabilizes, ultrastructural changes revert back to normal, functional change in the permeability, LM ratio also decreases, and translocation is also less. These are the photographs showing the expression of various proteins, tight junction proteins, claudin and zonidin, claudin-3, and these are the ultrastructural changes we, which we see you can make out that this channel is quite dilated here and after enteral nutrition, it is almost normal. These are the changes in the mitochondria and you can see the changes in the villus also, microvilli length, density and disorganization, which we see in acute pancreatitis. It also revert back to normal after nutrition therapy. So we can skip these two, three slides. So as far as nutrition therapy is concerned, what is the rationale and what are the issues? As we know that it's a hypermetabolic state, so total energy expenditure is more, and so there should not be any deprivation. And the issues are through which route we should give nutrition, antral or parenteral, or oral. Then what are the, as far as timing are concerned, whether early or late, what type of formulation we can give, a polymeric, semi-elemental, or elemental, and role of immunonutrition or probiotics. As far as roots are concerned, we know there are three roots. Oral, that oral feeding in mild disease can be resumed when pain subsides. Antral, if patients is malnourished prior to attack or feeding cannot be started before seven days. And parenteral, unable to tolerate targeted requirement by antral nutrition, when antral nutrition is impossible, and due to prolonged ileus and pancreatic fistula, means high output fistula or pancreatic fistula is there and compartment syndrome is there. In that case, we can put these patients, if we cannot start nutrition within seven days, we can put these patients on parenteral nutrition. In mild acute pancreatitis, within a week, 80% of patients can be started on oral diet and oral diet is preferred. It should be low fat, soft and regular diet and we monitor for dietary tolerance like nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. So once pain subsides and tenderness subsides, we can safely give and when patient is feeling hungry. The best time to initiate antral nutrition is not clear. The meta analysis both within 24 hours and within 48 hours suggests that early antral nutrition is safe. The risk of mortality, multiple organ failure, infectious complications are less in early nutrition group. And an American Society for Antral Parental Nutrition recommend to initiate early antral nutrition within 24 to 48 hours. Early oral refeeding based on hunger in moderate and severe acute pancreatitis. This has also been shown that it can safely be given, it is effective and feasible. 
timing of oral feeding in acute pancreatitis. This is the systematic review and meta-analysis of five RCTs. And there was a significant decrease in length of stay. And there was no significant difference between the early refeeding group and standard refeeding group with respect to abdominal pain and distension. So what they concluded, that compared with the standard oral refeeding, early oral feeding safely reduced the length of hospital stay in patients with acute pancreatitis. Coming to total parenteral versus antral nutrition. Antral nutrition, as I have told you, that antral nutrition restored alteration in gut permeability. It is less risky for developing septic complication. It reduces the risk for septic complication and improve in systemic inflammatory response, organ failure, and decrease ICU stay with antral nutrition as compared to parenteral nutrition. So, as we know, antral nutrition uh, in severe acute pancreatitis helps in restoring gut barrier function. These are the trials I have listed where antral nutrition was compared with parenteral nutrition and they, they have shown that antral nutrition is safe and that significantly lowers the pancreatic inf infection rate or other infectious complications. So the systematic review of 15 RCTs and acute pancreatitis comparing antral nutrition with no supplementary nutrition, parenteral nutrition with no supplementary nutrition, and antral nutrition with parenteral nutrition. This was done, and there was no significant change in infectious complication when, and significant reduction in mortality when antral nutrition was compared with no supplementary nutrition. Same way, when parenteral nutrition was compared with no supplementary nutrition, there was no significant change in infectious complication. But when antral nutrition was compared with parenteral nutrition, there was reduction in infectious complication and no significant change in mortality. So what we can conclude from this, that use of either antral or parenteral nutrition in comparison with no supplementary nutrition is associated with a lower risk of death and antral nutrition is associated with, associated with a lower risk of infectious complication compared to parenteral nutrition. This is again a meta-analysis clearly showing that antral nutrition is better as far as infectious complication are concerned. This is a Again, the Cochrane review of eight trials on 348 patients, they have also shown that there is a trend towards a reduction in length of hospital stay and antral nutrition should be considered the standard of care. Now, antral versus parenteral in critically ill patients with severe pancreatitis, another meta-analysis of five randomized controlled trial of 348 patients. There also they have shown that significant reduction in overall mortality with parenteral nutrition with uh, antral nutrition and rate of multi-organ dysfunction was also less. So antral nutrition should be recommended as the preferred route of nutrition for critically ill patients with severe acute pancreatitis. Coming to nasogastric versus nasogenital route. Here also, this was our study. In fact, where we have shown that it is not inferior. Nasogastric is as good as naso nasogenital tube. And this is a randomized trial of four RCTs comprising of 237 patients with severe acute pancreatitis. And here also they have said that nasogastric nutrition was as safe and effective as nasogenital nutrition in patients with severe acute pancreatitis. Another meta-analysis where they have shown that nasogastric nutrition is efficacious in severe acute pancreatitis. They included six studies and nasogastric feed is efficacious in 90% of patients. This was only on nasogastric tube. Again, a meta-analysis of three trials where they have clearly shown that nasogastric is as good as nasogastric. And it, so they have said that considering the limited quality of evidence when tolerated, nasogastric nutrition appears to be very safe. And this is the latest meta-analysis done by Velour Group, Dr. Datta et al. It's a Cochrane review published this year only. And there they have clearly shown that neither the mortality, organ failure, or success rate was different. So nasogastric route is quite safe, easy, because if you want to place a tube, a nasogenital tube, you have to shift the patient to endoscopy room, and that's a cumbersome procedure. Now coming to immune nutrition. Again, here glutamine has been tried, glutamine and uh, omega-3, but uh, as far as glutamine is concerned, 20 grams per day of glutamine was given. This, this is our own study and 
what we have observed when we were giving oral glutamine, there was no significant difference on any of these endpoints, but the only thing is that CRP level was decreased to some extent. This is the meta-analysis of 10 uh, studies of 433 patients, 218 on conventional method and 215, they received glutamine to enrich nutrition support. So out of these 10 studies, in few IV uh, glutamine was given, and it was observed that IV route may be a better choice for drug administration as it helps in increasing the albumin level and decrease the C-reactive protein, decreases the incidence of infectious complication and mortality, and shorten the hospital stay. So it is superior to conventional method if you're giving by antral, not by antral, but by intravenous route. This is again a parenteral immunonutrition in acute pancreatitis. Here also seven articles, they have shown that it leads to reduction in risk of infectious complication. And so what we can say that this glutamine, if given intravenously, may be of some help, but not otherwise. As far as probiotics are concerned, again, this was, this was a trial which was uh, done by Bisselink et al., published in Lancet long time back. And in this trial, they have included 298 patients. So what they have observed that there was no reduction in infectious complication, but there was a significant higher mortality, 16% versus 6% in the group, those who were put on probiotics. And non-occlusive mesenteric ischemia was also high. Incidence of non-occlusive non mesenteric ischemia was also high. So they don't recommend the use of probiotic in acute pancreatitis. After this trial, in fact, we have stopped our trial. This was this Tri trial also showed no significant difference in any of the parameters like gut permeability or C-reactive protein. So this is the meta-analysis of four studies and there also they have clearly concluded that is of not much use. As far as formulations are concerned, we know we can use elemental, semi-elemental or polymeric formulations. And the systematic review and meta-analysis of antral nutrition formulation on we. They included, Petro included 20 RCTs and total number of patients which were there in these studies were 1,070. And what they have observed that none of the following was associated with a significant difference in feeding intolerance, whether we gave semi-elemental versus polymeric, when they compared semi-elemental versus polymeric, semi-element uh, supplementation of antral nutrition with probiotics and risk of infectious complication and death were no different. So use of polymeric compared with semi-elemental formulation doesn't lead to a significantly higher risk of feeding intolerance, infectious complication or death in patients with acute pancreatitis. And neither the supplementation of antral nutrition with probiotics nor the use of immunonutrition significantly improves the clinical outcome. So these are the, list, these are the studies I have listed in one, one table. And based on that, what was their conclusion and, guide, and their statements recommendations that as far as semi-elemental diets are concerned, they are recommended in routine clinical practice, but not no clinical research or basic research is needed. Polymeric can be recommended and there also no, no clinical or basic research is needed. Fiber enriched, they are not, these diets are not recommended routinely. Clinical research, yes, we can do clinical research in this area, but basic research is not needed. Probiotic and immunonutrition, these are not recommended. And so only basic science research is required in these areas. So this is a Cochrane review on antral nutrition formulation for AT, 15 trials included, and the quality of evidence of the effect of any kind of antral nutrition on mortality was low, and evidence remained insufficient to support the use of a specific antral nutrition formulation. Now coming to the timing of nutrition. When to initiate antral nutrition in severe acute pancreatitis? This was a retrospective review of a single center where they have shown a large number of patients were included in this retrospective review and they have shown that early antral nutrition has significant benefit over the delayed antral nutrition in the degrees of organ failure and mortality. And first 48 hours of admission in the ICU was the optimal time to start antral nutrition. Then, this is again a, a meta-analysis of randomized trial, 10 RCTs, 1, 000, more than 1,000 patients, 
and where antral nutrition was provided within 48 hours after admission in severity into pancreatitis. And what they have shown that there was a, a reduction, food risk ratio was um, for mortality, for organ failure, for operative intervention, systemic inflammation, local septic complications, GI symptoms, SIRS, and local complications. So what they have concluded that antral nutrition within 48 hours after admission is efficient and safe for patients with severe acute pancreatitis. This is early, means within 24 hours of randomization versus on-demand, a very good study, Python trial, where what, what they have done, they, this was a Dutch study on, carried out at 19 center, including two, and included 208 patients. And the, what was uh, the important finding that there was no difference in the primary endpoint, that, that is major infection or death during six months of follow-up. And this trial did not show the superiority of early nasoenteric tube feeding as compared with an oral diet, which they started within 72 hours. And more than 70% patients could tolerate oral diet uh, within 72 hours, means after 72 hours, in reducing the rate of infections or death in patients with acute pancreatitis at high risk for complication. This is another meta-analysis of early antral nutrition provided within 24 hours admission on clinical outcome in AP. Eight studies, 729 patients included. And here also they have shown that early antral nutrition within 24 hours of admission is safe and provides benefit for predicted severe or severe acute pancreatitis but not for mild to moderate pancreatitis. So now in the end, I thought that instead of giving just one slide, I'll read few guidelines. These are ISPEN guidelines published this year only. So which patients with acute pancreatitis are considered at nutritional risk? All patients with predicted mild to moderate acute pancreatitis should be screened using validated screening methods such as NRS202, However, the patients with predicted severe acute pancreatitis should always be considered at nutrition risk. Any patient in ICU for more than 48 hours should be considered at nutrition risk. Is early oral feeding feasible in patients with predicted mild acute pancreatitis? Yes, oral feeding should be offered as soon as clinically tolerated and independent of serum lipase concentration in patients with predicted mild severe pancreatitis. We can start with low-fat soft oral diet and should be used when reinitiating oral feeding patients with mild acute pancreatitis. If required, what type of medical nutrition is preferable, antral or parenteral? Definitely antral nutrition is preferred. What is the optimal time? As soon as possible, within 24 to 72 hours. And what type of antral nutrition is indicated? A standard polymeric diet is as good as any other medication. What route should be used? I think nasogastric is as good as nasojejunal. In patients with acute pancreatitis, when parenteral nutrition should be initiated, if antral nutrition or if the nutritional need cannot be met by giving uh, antral nutrition or there is intolerance to antral nutrition or patient is having, say, abdominal compartment syndrome, something of that sort, if it is there, patient is not being able to tolerate, there we should give which patient AP has considered at this This I have already covered. And how, how antral and parallel nutrition is given patient with intra-abdominal hypertension. This is important. If intra-abdominal hypertension is less than 15 millimeter of mercury, early antral should be initiated via nasogastric or nasogenual tube. If it is more than 15, that antral nutrition should be initiated via nasogenual route starting at low dose, 20 ml per hour and increasing the rate according to the tolerance. There may be a need for temporary reduction or discontinuation. If intra-abdominal pressure is more than 20 millimeter of mercury or in the presence of abdominal compartment syndrome, it should be temporarily stopped. In severe acute pancreatitis and open abdomen, it can be administered. Is there any role of immunonutrition? Definitely not as, as, far, as, the, as far as the evidence is there till date. Is there any role of probiotic? Again, there is no role of probiotic. And is there any role of use of oral enzyme? I think that is also not there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anup Sadaya, for this uh, uh, very detailed and informative talk. Uh, I think uh, uh, it's open for questions now. There is one question which has come from uh, Pune is that uh, why, why the patient is quite sick most of the time? Why do you want to feed immediately? And is, is it not better to keep them in early and start uh, nutrition a little later? 
actually there is no need the early you start better it is if patient having only mild disease if you are giving antral nutrition as i have, that is why i have showed few slides of our work, that because in case we are not giving antral nutrition early then the gut atrophy may set in there may be the loss of barrier function more chances of trans translocation of gut bacteria or endotoxemia and that can in fact perpetuate the injury so it is better to start we start with even if patient is not been able to tolerate bolus feed we give a small feed, a trophic feed to keep the intestine uh, actually the, to prevent the atrophy of intestine in acute pancreatitis uh, with abdominal pain is um, inter, it can we start enteral feeding in the presence of pain i have said that it, it, the moment the pain subsides Or there is urge for feed. You can start. Doctor Sareya, yes, uh, I have a question. Hi, uh, is, is there any data on continuous feeding versus intermittent feeding? The the question the reason I'm asking you is sometimes in the night you do not want to even nasogastric feed. So, uh, sometimes you can you can get aspiration etc. So is there any 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 problem in Cutting the night feed and giving it during the day, sir, intermittent versus continuous. Is there any data on that, sir? In case if if we can, if we if we go by the by the recommendation in critically ill patients or in ICU patients, what they say that if we can give seventy percent of requirement of nutrition through any route, suppose during the daytime we can meet this requirement up to say seventy to eighty percent of of the requirement of nutrition then we can give that much during the daytime and if it is inconvenient for the patient we can stop it during the night and pancreatitis we don't want to give, we don't want to give during the night hours especially those who develop or to develop say uh, there is ileus then chances of aspiration are more so in that case night time feed we can avoid we can give by late evening how as far as 70 to 80% of what is required then in that case even night feeding can be avoided because the situation is not as bad as in chronic liver disease because in chronic liver disease you have to avoid prolonged fasting here that situation is not there so even if you are giving adequate nutrition during the day time during night time you can if you want you can stop it. but there is no study as such comparing the two in cases of severe acute pancreatitis still did uh, no no in a in a patient who is uh, uh, sick and he has no urge for uh, uh, desire for food and in those patient or for example a patient critically ill and is on ventilator and what will be your objective criteria for nutrition or just like that you start nutrition on uh, 24 hours onwards is there any objective yeah. criteria by which you can say yes that? yes yeah. for critically ill patients those who are in icu i have already told you the international guidelines means the guideline says that any patient who is in icu for more than 48 hours is at risk at at nutrition risk you assess the risk by either uh, nutrition risk score Uh, 2002 or nutric score if patient is at risk i think it is better to start nutrition we we calculate the re- nutrition requirement by indirect calorimetry and here comes the concept of permissive undernutrition we don't give total nutrition or total energy whatever we calculate by indirect calorimetry if we are using equations then equations tend to over calculate the nutritional requirement of a person so if we are using indirect calorimetry then the chances of over nutrition will be less now if a patient is in icu you are saying patient is critically ill and in icu if he is having a disease beforehand he is malnourished then we have to be extra careful because if we are giving total nutrition early and that too in the initial stage we may precipitate refeeding syndrome so in a malnourished person we have to be extra careful and we have to calculate we have to estimate the blood sugar and 
phosphate, magnesium level, just to avoid refeeding syndrome. If a patient is taking alcohol for long, in that case, thiamine should also be given before initiating uh, nutrition. And then we have to monitor if we are giving um, uh, high uh, quantity of nutrition. You see, what happens during critical illness, the whole metabolism is deranged. There is insulin resistance. And if we are giving extra calories and if we are giving extra glucose, then it will not be utilized and there will be hyperglycemia in ICU. So we have to manage this hyperglycemia also. We don't want to give too much of insulin as well because you have to prevent hypo also. So no tight control, no extra calories, but yes, nutrition should be initiated early. If a patient is not in a position and mind it, antral root is preferred, only parenteral root should be used only when antral is not possible. Initial two, two to three days, say 24 to 48 hours, you may just keep that patient on IV fluids. And in case you are not in a position to initiate antral nutrition or in, initiate oral feed, in that case, it is better to place a tube and start tube feeding. If that, that tube feeding is not tolerable, patient develops a patient is having IBS or he develops pain or something else, in that case, we can withhold it for some time. We can give prokinetics and again restart the therapy. And in case for seven days, we are not in a position to initiate oral feed, only then we should resort to parenteral nutrition. Thank you, Anub, and it's a good thing. Uh, see, there one, uh, can I have one quick uh, comment and uh, comment on this particular issue? It's that uh, intra-abdominal pressure monitoring is being done in those patients. Now, maybe that uh, Dr. Rajesh will be highlighting on that. In uh, wild nutrition, in which condition, which situation you recommend that for patients uh, on monitoring of intra-abdominal pressure? And another thing is that, uh, what is your impression about the uh, elemental feed or the market available formulation or made in the canteen or hospital or at home feeds for enteral feeding? Two comments, please. Uh Actually, uh, in any patient of pancreatitis, if patients having reef, it, when we start feeding and if he is having pain or there is distension of abdomen, ileus, in that case, we monitor intra-abdominal pressure, number one. Number two, what you have said, whether we can use blenderized homemade diet or hospital diet, yes, we can. In fact, that study is going on. I have already recruited more than 50 patients. And uh, in the previous uh, observational study, what uh, my impression is that any diet can be given we, you don't have to uh, resort to uh, formulations or uh, commercial formulations or for that matter, elemental or semi-elemental diet. Polymeric, hospital-based, blenderized diet is as good as any other diet. Thank you, Sir Anup Zaraya, for this wonderful deliberation. And I request Dr. Ashwa Jago to take over for the next uh, uh, talk. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Anup, can you stop sharing your slides? I think we are continuing without a break. We are, uh, yeah. So we, are, we will not be having a coffee break as we are running late. So we will go on to the next talk. It's an interesting one. It's intensive care in acute pancreatitis. This is not something that we often hear or hear lectures. And for this, we have uh, Professor Rajeshwari Subramaniam from the head anesthesia and critical care from AIMS. Over to you, Dr. Uh, Professor Subramaniam. Uh, let me just add here that uh, uh, Dr. Rajeshwari is the one that all of us, you know, uh, whenever we have a problem, we always go to her. And she is the one who is the rescuer for all our sick patients. So, and thank you very much, ma'am. I know uh, uh, there are some issues, but thank you very much for joining and giving this talk. Grateful. Uh, very good evening to all the panelists and I really thank uh, the organizers for inviting me to this pancreas club. It seems like a very exclusive club and I've you know put my foot into it today. So uh, without any ado, I'll come to my topic and uh, I would like to say at the outset that uh, I will be just you know putting my foot again into what Dr. Pramod covered and a few questions which were raised by Dr. Ashok Chaku, some of the answers in that maybe and uh, any other questions which might be interesting you may please ask me. So just a second, I'll just go to switch to this. Yeah. 
this is only this is not sharing one second hmm. we can see your slides yeah but it's not sort of progressing hmm. forward hmm. Uh, just click on the click on the slide madam click on the oh okay right 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 thank you so much so uh, um, the all uh, i think the members of the pancreas club and generally gastroenterologists would already know that maybe two decades ago uh, there was a lot of stress on very aggressive uh, surgical management of patients with pancreatitis and it was called the surgical odc which was which had a very high and unacceptably high mortality and uh, it was recognized two decades ago that if there was early non surgical management especially with a good icu the outcome was very much improved and this has been made possible not only with good icu management but a lot of other advances which have occurred in radiology and surgery but multi pronged icu management is the cornerstone of good management of the majority of patients of acute pancreatitis and this basically involves as has been covered already adequate analgesia good fluid resuscitation with hemodynamic monitoring ventilatory or organ support in the icu nutrition which has already been covered and a repeated review of the patient as to how he is progressing by way of lab reports and also imaging and to see whether there is a need for any surgical intervention fluid resuscitation was covered excellently by dr pramod so i will not dwell much on it except to ask certain questions that we have seen a lot of articles which have covered aggressive fluid therapy then there are some which have said that there are a lot of side effects or adverse effects of giving adverse um, giving high volume liquids fluids and um, why are we so confused so it was actually originally believed that why iv hydration was considered so beneficial was to restore splanctic perfusion and to restore the oxygen delivery to pancreas especially in parts of the pancreas which had a critical perfusion which is called the penumbra of the pancreas but um, in spite of uh, many articles coming repeatedly there is really no concrete guidelines and as uh, these articles have been mentioned before some of the articles said that a rapid rate of initial fluid resuscitation diminished in hospital mortality then there was another study which also said that uh, the these patients who had an aggressive fluid uh, replacement which is 20 ml per kg bolus followed by 3 ml per kg per hour showed less incidence of sers and hemo concentration and did not really show any evidence of overhydration also had reduced organ failure ICU. Uh, this is a side of branch it was also noticed in another study uh, in patients who were undergoing uh, retrograde cholangiopancreatography that if they were hydrated very well post ercp a, a, slight, a less significantly lesser number of them actually developed pancreatitis compared to patients who had undergone standard hydration therapy so all this led one to believe that pancreatitis is a is a condition where you have to be really generous with the fluid uh, replacement then along came lot of studies or i should say a significant number of studies which started reporting poor outcome after rapid fluid expansion and uh, these patients had higher apache scores showed lot of signs of fluid sequestration developed abdominal compartment syndrome and also there was one or two studies which showed a very poor survival rate in these uh, patients along with uh, development of aki and many other such complications so then came the middle path and then as uh, i think dr matthew philip mentioned uh, it was recognized that there were two phases in these patients one was an early phase of 248 hours where there was a very high likelihood of arteriolar vasoconstriction capillary leakage and also pancreatic hypoperfusion and necrosis and if, if fluids were given at this stage then they could probably prevent the development of uh, uh, further advancement of the pancreatitis and also organ failure and so the benefit of aggressive uh, hydration actually depends on the severity of the pancreatitis patient so uh, and many studies had the drawback that they did not really um, measure the time from the start of pain to admission this was not mentioned in most studies the time was evaluated only when the patient came to that particular hospital even the previous hospitalization was usually not considered so the fluid resuscitation should be very dynamic and we have to know our resuscitation goals the comorbidities of the patient and the lab values alongside resuscitation Uh, this recent uh, meta analysis published in the world journal of gastroenterology included 11 studies with more than uh, 2500 patients and uh, in this no significance difference was found between groups in the overall incidence of sers or organ failure or pancreatic necrosis so here again we were in a dilemma so uh, then uh, again in this uh, very recent article it, it was again uh, divided the patients were divided into two groups of when they came to the hospital the early group was when uh, 
the patients came within first four to six hours of onset of symptoms. And usually the setting is in the emergency department when the gastro person can, uh, gastro doctor sees the patient first. And here the management is usually determined by the local protocols, the experience of the doctor and clinical science. And these patients are till then unlikely to have any complications and <clears throat> fluid, aggressive fluid replacement may be beneficial in the outcome of the pancreatitis. In the late group, that is which cross the six hours when the patient has actually reached the general ward or is in the ICU. There the determinants are, how did he respond to the early fluid? Did, does he have any organ failure? Does he have any AKI? Because by this time, the complications have started to set in early and here aggressive fluid therapy is less likely to impact the outcome. In fact, this article also gave out a few uh, uh, protocols or guidelines for fluid replacement. Unfortunately, which were not really very clear, it did mention an initial bolus of 20 mil per kg followed by a maintenance of 3 mil per kg per hour. And the clinical goals, as mentioned by Dr. Pramod, they mentioned a mean arterial pressure, a volume overload parameters, and lung examination, absence of crackles. Now, in today's world and in today's ICUs, these are very, very primitive parameters and we have much better indices by which we can and should monitor these things. So what is new in hemodynamic monitoring? So we all know that there are a lot of confounders of volume measurements in patients with pancreatitis. They have very high intrathoracic pressures because of a variety of reasons and the cardiac filling pressures are already increased in spite of reduced venous return. This could be because of a combination of intra-abdominal pressure, high intra-abdominal pressure because of ascites or bowel edema, ileus, mechanical ventilation, mediastinal edema, and pleural effusions, which we all know are mortality indicator. So uh, there, therefore, the central venous pressure and even pulmonary capillary wedge pressures may not be accurate at all. Further, uh, these patients do present with decreased fluid intake, vomiting, or ileus lot of exudation fluid collections lost into the third space, which can actually contribute intravascular fluid deficiency. So now what are the parameters we must have? We must have some index which shows us the volume responsiveness rather than having a static volume measurement. So that means we should know what is a patient doing when we give him fluid. So here comes a, a very active role of ultrasound and also the transthoracic echocardiography. As I said, uh, the traditional preload parameters like CVP and uh, pulmonary capillary wedge pressures are static measurements with limited value. And the volume responsiveness um, indices are global end diastolic volume index, I'll be just explaining to you, the intrathoracic blood volume index, and the stroke volume variation and the pulse pressure variation. To measure these, uh, this may sound like a lot of advanced technology, but you'll be very glad to know that we have this technology already in our country. Most of our uh, uh, equipment manufacturers and other uh, companies, they give us all these options. And the stroke volume variation and the pulse pressure variation can be calculated from the arterial trace very well. And uh, some of these technologies also give us a measure of the extra vascular lung water index, which is a very good marker for fluid overload. So these are the dynamic indices, the stroke volume variation, the pulse pressure variation, the systolic pressure variation, and the IVC distensibility index. I will not go into the details. So suffice it to say that when we do um, pulse pressure variation or stroke volume variation, it basically does not tell us how much volume the person has got, but it actually tells us what he's doing when we actually raise his preload. So for example, the y-axis shows us the stroke volume change, and the x-axis is showing the preload. As we keep increasing the preload, so what happens to the uh, stroke volume? Is that increasing or is that static or does it actually fall? That is the value of this measurement. And coming to the pulse pressure variation, if we freeze the RT trace, then we can easily calculate the pulse pressure variation. If it is more than 12%, the patient is said to be volume responsive, which means that we can, uh, with some courage, give him some fluid and we don't have to fear that he will go into overload or cardiac failure. So the global end diastolic volume is another uh, very upcoming and trending uh, parameter. So this is a hypothetical volume which assumes a situation that all the four heart chambers are simultaneously in the diastolic phase. So this combines the end diastolic volume of all the four cardiac chambers and the iota and the IBC. So it gives us this so-called central blood volume in the patient. So these can be measured by PICO technology, which I said is easily available in many of our monitors and which we will be shortly acquiring in our ICU. PICO technology uh, in, um, involves the use of a, an arterial line and a central venous catheter, and it calculates a lot of parameters. Some of them are 
continuous, like it can give us a continuous value of the cardiac index. It can give us a continuous index of the volume responsiveness, which I think is very, very useful because it can tell us continuously as we give the fluids, as Dr. Pramod said, we can give the fluid and keep on noticing what is happening to the SVB. And also it can give us discontinuous data like thermodilution. So we can just inject cold saline and it will give us a global end diastolic volume and also some evidence of the organ function. The advantages of PICO are that it's very less invasive because it requires only the CVP and an arterial catheter. It can be used in small children. It can be installed very quickly, just takes that much of time as to put an arterial line and a central line, doesn't require any chest X-ray. And uh, we can also immediately rule out lung edema or overload at the same time. This has been the subject of uh, publication in critical care medicine. This was about some time back, but still it's a very useful study. So here the authors um, uh, studied, um, um, they, they, they wanted to study the use of PICO in patients with uh, acute pancreatitis. And here 24 patients with severe or necrotizing pancreatitis were enrolled who all had uh, Apache scores of more than eight. And uh, the hemodynamic measurements were performed with PICO. Uh, yeah, there was a total of nine to six measurements which were done. And simultaneously, the CVP and the hematocrit was also measured because the primary objective was to see whether there was any hyper or hypovolemia and the correlation with the hematocrit and the CVP. It was found that in the majority of patients, the CVP was actually raised, whereas the interthoracic blood volume index was actually reduced. So the presence, prevalence of hypovolemia was nearly there in 50% of patients with the CVP was normal in all these patients. And for elevated CVP, the corresponding interthoracic blood volume index was also low. So there was actually no correlation between these two parameters at all. So uh, hematocrit had a slightly good correlation with, with, with the central blood volume uh, index. And um, so there was no correlation at all between these values. And so, um, just a second. So, uh, so, so that, that speaks uh, a lot for uh, uh, involving or getting new technologies into our ICU and our uh, you know, uh, high dependency units to monitor these patients. And as already told by Dr. Pramod, uh, IVC screening and scanning is a very useful tool which we are regularly using. So we can actually, um, uh, we can assess the inferior vena cava, the lungs and the IJV and the cardiac function simultaneously by echocardiography and by ultrasound and then give a score. So we can give a score for the echo, a score for the IVC, for the lung ultrasound and the IJV. And then it can be added together to diagnose hypovolemia or uvolemia or hypervolemia. And there has been found to be good correlation between clinical assessment and a safe score. Uh, again, this is one field which uh, is very, very important. And I'm just touching upon it of some topics which are not covered. Uh, analgesia is of paramount importance in acute pancreatitis and although there have been a lot of studies which have evaluated opiates, and I think these have been already uh, presented by Dr. Pramod, so I will not uh, go over them in detail. It has already been found that uh, <clears throat> in the Co Cochrane review as well, that there's a, a general lack of information for the majority of studies which we used opiates, and also many of them were underpowered, and so it prevents us accurately evaluating opiates. As, as uh, anesthesia people, we are very much interested in pain control, and um, this was a study which was published long ago, it was in 2002, where epidural anesthesia was used in 121 patients who had um, pancreatitis. This is a French study. And uh, in these, the amylase and the lipase normalized. Uh, and then there were 16 people out of the 121 who required artificial ventilation. And the mortality at that time was only 2.5%. Now this uh, uh, small editorial published by Dr. Govil uh, very recently in the Indian Journal of Critical Care Medicine, uh, it, it says, you know, where are we now going? Where do we go? What is there with the epidural? So uh, although intravenous opioid analgesics are com very commonly used for pain control, epidural analgesia, which we are commonly using for post-operative pain is proving itself in many, many ways for out improving outcomes in acute pancreatitis. So how is that happening? So um, uh, this was a study uh, which was published in 2006, and it was found, uh, this was a study done in rats. But um, in these rats, a group was subjected to experimental acute pancreatitis by the injection of taurocholic acid into the pancreatic duct. The second group had an epidural catheter inserted through which local anesthetic was given. And the third group had an epidural catheter inserted after which pancreatitis was created. And then after which they were again uh, given dose through the epidural catheter. 
So it was found that in group one, <clears throat> In, in group one, the, um, uh, this, was the, this was the study of the oxygenation, the, the survival. And in group two, sorry, I'm sorry. This was the pancreatic circulation, which was studied by Doppler. In group one, the circulation abruptly fell where there was no epidural. And in group two, I'm sorry, this is not actually working. But in group two, the uh, pancreatic circulation actually improved where there was no um, uh, no uh, acute pancreatitis is produced. And in group three, the values almost improved back to baseline. This was the rats which had received epidural analgesia and in, who, in whom the acute pancreatitis scenario was created. So this probably uh, works by changing the pancreatic microcirculation and improves the oxygen delivery to the pancreas and probably helps to stall the progress of uh, severe acute pancreatitis. And it could be <clears throat> probably because part of the effect could be because of sympathetic blockade, uh, the good effect of it on this pancreatic circulation. There are some concerns that if in patients who have coagulopathy, uh, we may not be able to insert this catheter. And uh, how long can we keep the catheter in situ? Well, people have kept it even for two weeks. We have kept it for more than two weeks without any issues. This is a similar study in pigs, which was a very, very elegantly done study where they measured the cardiac output and all hemodynamic parameters, as well as the uh, splanchnic perfusion and the pancreatic perfusion. <clears throat> it was found that the pigs which received the thoracic epidural analgesia exhibited superior survival, superior tissue oxygenation, and enhanced microcirculatory perfusion. So uh, in this uh, patient, in, in this uh, study, which was uh, done in 2015, there were patients, uh, 35 patients recruited, half of which whom, rec whom received a thoracic epidural analgesia. And it was found that they also had a significant improvement in pancreatic perfusion at, as studied by Doppler with improved pain scores. And importantly, a significantly less number of them progressed to severe pancreatitis and had less necrosectomy. But it did not produce any difference in mortality or mortality. So considering that uh, thoracic epidural analgesia favorably affects the splanctic and the micro, uh, micro, uh, pancreatic microcirculation, and um, it may probably even uh, provide better um, regression through nitrogen pathways, it has also been seen to reduce hepatic apoptosis by improved splanctic circulation. So a lot of methods, many of them are still under <clears throat> a lot of studies. But there are numerous ways in which epidural anesthesia seem to be helping patients with pancreatitis. The pan study is still underway. And this is a very large uh, multicentric study where the effic efficacy of epidural on pancreatitis is being still evaluated. So uh, this uh, new study, this is a um, propensity analysis. It's a study on pancreatitis, thoracic epidural analgesia. So here, more than 1,000 patients were uh, enrolled, where only 46 received an epidural analgesia. And it was found that the risk of all-cause 30-day mortality in patients who received thoracic epidural was significantly lower than in the matched patients who did not receive it. This study is from um, uh, GTB Hospital in Delhi uh, from Dr. Asha Tyagi and her group. And here they um, enrolled 32 patients with predicted severe acute pancreatitis. And uh, they were randomized to receive thoracic epidural analgesia or intravenous morphine boluses to keep their pain control, keep the pain score under four. And they were daily assessed by the SOFA score. And the secondary objective was the duration of hospitalization. So, uh, they found that uh, the daily SOFA score actually showed improvement for the epidural group and a worsening for the patients who did not receive the epidural. And uh, the thoracic epidural group also exhibited less cardiovascular, hematological, CNS and renal system deterioration. This group also showed a higher respiratory failure rate that could probably be because they had a higher SOFA score at admission itself, but mechanical ventilation and mortality was significantly less in this group still, in spite of the higher SOFA score initially compared to the non-thoracic uh, epidural group. So this is actually food for thought because use of thoracic epidural is definitely associated with a trend towards better outcome. And um, the recovery from respiratory failure is being seem to be faster. There are a lot of caveats which we can observe, like it's important to avoid large volumes of local anesthetic. The other aspect is the ventilatory management in the ICU because the majority of patients who come refer to us present with respiratory failure. And uh, respiratory failure tends to occur in the very early phase when the patient comes to the hospital. And occasionally it may occur in a delayed way, secondary to sepsis. 
what we have observed is they, these patients require very high ventilatory pressures and PEEP, primarily secondary to because of their ascites, pleural effusion, abdominal compartment syndrome, and ARDS. As Dr. Pramod uh, nice mentioned, we, measure, we uh, monitor these patients regularly by ultrasound, uh, lung, lung ultrasound, and see the evol evolution of their lungs, the disease, the consolidation, and fluid overload in these patients. And uh, normally, uh, patients who are subjected to mechanical ventilations are those who have hypoxemia, which is not responding to conventional oxygen, who are showing onset of respiratory fatigue or in hemodynamic instability, who have altered consciousness or severe metabolic acidosis, or who have stepped into multi-organ failure. Now, in this setting comes the role of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. This was a study published about uh, three years ago from uh, China, where uh, uh, the uh, patients who patients were randomized to uh, um, receiving non uh, they were um, it was compared uh, the non invasive positive pressure ventilation use was compared between patients who were admitted with severe acute pancreatitis they were patients who were uh, having mild disease as well as moderate and severe uh, disease so of uh, 127 patients 44 had mild pancreatitis, 64 moderate, and 19 had spare ARDS when they presented to the ICU. The mild group did not uh, <clears throat> undergo any intubation. <clears throat> the moderate group, about 23% underwent uh, intubation. And of the severe group, nearly 50% underwent in, uh, intubation. Of the patients who had a successful non-invasive ventilation, all the parameters uh, tended to improve. And of these, only 24 patients actually failed the NIV and required intubation. What this study tried to say was that non-invasive positive pressure ventilation may be a very effective option for the initial treatment of ARDS patients who come with acute pancreatitis because it may spare intubation and therefore lead to a shorter ICU stay. But it should be applied very prudently in the more severe disease and failure is very likely in patients who are obese or who have ascites or bilateral effusions or ARDS. There is another device known as the high flow nasal cannula, which is a non-invasive device, which has dramatically changed pneumonia management in COVID disease. And it produces high flows, which satisfies air hunger and high inspiratory flows, which are usually generated by patients with respiratory distress. It also generates some amount of CPAP, which prevents atelectasis. And the patient can actually talk and eat when he's on high flow nasal cannula. So this is the circuit and we presently have a lot of equipment with us of this variety. And um, so finally, the cool points are that we should admit uh, these patients with acute pancreatitis who are looking uh, not very well to the ICU as early as possible. Fluid resuscitation should be not overtly aggressive, but take into consideration all the available parameters and try to use as many volume responsive parameters as we can. And aggressive and maximum analgesia should be provided. And I think that uh, this is probably, uh, it would be a good idea to study the use of thoracic epidural in very early in the disease and see whether it can prevent progress to more advanced disease. And non-invasive ventilation should be always considered in lieu of positive pressure ventilation. Thank you very much. Take up probably one or two questions. You can hear me, Dr. Rajesh Shuri? Oh, yes, I can hear. Okay, uh, there's a question from Rajesh Gopal Krishna from Kochi. Is hemodynamic monitoring crucial in clinical practice like with pancreatitis in initial 24 to 72 hours? I think it is absolutely mandatory, and this was highlighted by Dr. Pramod Garg as well. Uh, there's just no uh, point to uh, aggr uh, aggressively hydrate a patient or do anything if we cannot monitor the patient because these patients uh, may do very well or may actually deteriorate because of fluid therapy. So it's very important to monitor them. Plus, many of them do come with comorbidities in the form of cardiac failure or renal failure. So it's very, very important to monitor them uh, as much as possible with volume responsive parameters. Another question from Dr. Jatin. What is the difference between IVC distensibility and collapsibility index? So when the patient is on mechanical ventilation, we use the IVC distensibility index. And when the patient is on spontaneous ventilation, it is called IVC collapsibility index. So it in both involves the measurement of the IVC with using the M mode. After we scan the IVC diameter, both in inspiration and expiration. When the patient is on positive pressure ventilation, as expected, 
with IPPV, the IVC distends with uh, inspiration, but in spontaneous, it actually tends to become smaller. Thank you, Dr. Rajeshwari. Been a wonderful talk. Uh, a lot of important points like the role of epidural and uh, the high flow cannula, etc. Uh, but I think we are totally out of uh, time and uh, maybe the organizers can send you the other questions and you can reply to them by mail. Uh, now the I'm last... Sorry, I didn't... Thank you. Uh, Dr. Matthew Philip. Uh... Yeah. No, no, probably at the end of the uh, whole talk, so if there is time, I think there are so many questions on uh, critical care we can take up if time permits. So can I request uh, Dr. Jayanti to introduce Dr. Nagi Reddy, very important talk he's going to tell us. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Uh, Jayanti, can you please introduce Dr. Professor Nagi Reddy? Over to Dr. Nagesh Reddy. He's, he'll be speaking to us on the role of ARCP in acute pancreatitis, risks and benefits. Over to Dr. Nagi. He's well known for his enormous contributions in the field of endoscopy. Thank and, you. And innovations. Thank you very much. So I'll share my slides. Uh, I've been asked to talk on uh, the role of ERCP in acute pancreatitis. In fact, uh, this is a very controversial subject, which is uh, been, I'll just share my slides. Okay, can you see my slides? Yes, Nagi, yes, you are fine. So, the role of ERCP in acute pancreatitis, uh, like any other procedure in acute pancreatitis, you have to be very careful to weigh the risks versus the benefits and look at all the conditions where ERCP is going to be useful is predominantly gallstone pancreatitis. There are other very rare indications I shall come to that, but it's predominantly only gallstone pancreatitis. Now, this concept on gallstone pancreatitis came because of the fact that uh, famous OP's theory that gallstones can get stuck in the lower end of the CBD and result in backflow bile can result in pancreatitis. And sometimes you have seen patients like this where the stone is actually stuck, come with severe pain with uh, acute onset pancreatitis, and then you do an ERCP and relieve this obstruction, and these patients have dramatic relief. But unfortunately, this is not so simple as it sounds. If you look at the history of uh, the literature that's published over the last 30 years, you'll find that there have been several randomized controlled trials with all sorts of uh, issues coming in. In fact, uh, the first trial was in 1988 by a group in Leeds uh, in Lancet, and since then there have been several. What I shall do over the next few minutes is to try and summarize this 30 year history and give certain guidelines of what we should do uh, in our patients. Now, the first trial that came showed it was a single center trial, which was positive, saying that in patients with uh, acute severe pancreatitis, if we do ERCP, it's helpful especially if they have CBD stones. Subsequently, another trial from uh, Hong Kong. This was in patients with cholangitis, showed it's effective. But unfortunately, a German trial showed that it was, in fact, not only dangerous to do ERCP in these patients, but there was a significant mortality because of respiratory failure. Now, the reason why all these trials were having variability was because uh, they had different assessment of severity of acute gallstone pancreatitis. Some of them took uh, not very severe cases. The timing of ERCP is very variable, ranging from 24 hours to one week. The exclusion criteria variable. In ex and of course, like any endoscopy trial, endoscopy experience was uh, variable. And they were heterogeneous group of patients. So therefore, all these trials uh, uh, were having contradictory effect. And then came, of course, uh, um, several meta-analysis uh, based on these trials. And you can see that all these uh, meta-analysis again had different opinions. Uh, the first one showed that there's overall decrease in complications and mortality. And finally, a Petros trial actually showed that although overall complication mortality decreased in cholangitis patient, in absence of cholangitis, there was no benefit at all. And this was very important. Based on this, several guidelines came in different societies. The British Society of Gastroenterology in 2005 said, said that all patients with predicted severe pancreatitis should have an ERCP, um, whereas the American College of Gastroenterology said those only with acute cholangitis and severe acute gallstone pancreatitis. Whereas finally, the AGA in this 2007 guideline said that uh, 
those uh, early patients uh, with acute gallstone pancreatitis without cholangitis, ARCP is controversial. So it was now tending towards the fact that this is going to be useful only in severe acute gallstone or predicted severe acute gallstone pancreatitis with cholangitis. The reason why there's been so much of controversy is that ERCP is generally not a procedure that everybody does. And especially in acute pancreatitis, there can be several problems, including edema of the papilla. These are examples here, uh, where cannulation can become very difficult. And this was a Marty Freeman study where they looked at ERCP in patients with acute pancreatitis, and they found that uh, when it was successful, it was okay. But if it failed in these patients, the complication rates were very high. The, the need for reintervention was very high. So we are paying a huge price by trying to do ERCP in these patients, especially if the indication is not strong. And that's the reason why we are searching for the right indication in these patients. There are other potential complications when you try ERCP in acute biliary pancreatitis. Not only infection, but these patients tend to bleed more. If you don't adequately drain, cholangitis is there, and there's a lot of friability in the duodenum in that area, and perforation rates are higher. So for all these reasons, you have to be sure, one, about the indications of ERCP and the timing of ERCP in these patients. Now, the slides are not moving, so I just try. Yeah. So in patients with... Uh, uh, ERCP for gallstone pancreatitis, everything has changed with the advent of endoscopic ultrasound. Now we can be sure whether there is something blocking the CBD and resulting in uh, pancreatitis or whether we are presuming that something is there. That uncertainty has completely gone off with the advent of US. Of course, in centers where US is still not easily available, uh, some of these uh, points apply, but where endoscopic ultrasound is there, the whole approach has completely changed. And this is uh, based on this very interesting article that came from Hong Kong several years back. They had 140 patients with acute pancreatitis, not assigned uh, to which condition, but they put them into two groups, those who underwent the US and those who directly underwent ERCP. And you can see that those who underwent US, 45 of them did not have CBD stones. So unnecessary ERCP was avoided. And those who had CBD stones, ERCP could be done successfully. And we know that in those people who have a CBD stone, ERCP is much easier than you don't have. But look at the patients who went directly for ERCP. Out of the 70, ERCP was only successful in 60. Many of them didn't have CBD stones. And those who had CBD stones, of course, could be cleared. But clearly, the morbidity was much less in those patients who underwent the US first. So, in my opinion, in all patients with acute gallstone pancreatitis, especially predicted acute gallstone pancreatitis, an endoscopic ultrasound is almost a must to know whether there's a real obstruction or not. Uh, again, a European study which actually looked at this very carefully, ERCP was the US, and you can see that those who went directly for ERCP had a much higher morbidity uh, compared to those with the US. In fact, there's a single mortality also. So all these studies have very clearly shown that US followed by ERCP is ideal in these uh, patients. So from concluding from all these studies, one can say a strategy based on endoscopic ultrasound before ERCP is an effective alternative to just to try and do ERCP in this patient. So this has changed completely. So it's quite clear now that if you have a patient with predicted severe pancreatitis, cholangitis, urgent ERCP. Whereas those patients who don't have biliary pancreatic obstruction based on clinical lab or radiological, no endoscopic intervention should be done. And this is where most of the problems occur. Trying to intervene in patients who don't have a biliary pancreatic obstruction by ERCP. Now, what about patients who have obstruction but no cholangitis? This has been a very controversial area. Should we do an urgent ERCP and try and relieve these patients? Uh, this, we didn't have an answer till recently. And recently, we have this very uh, famous Dutch multicenter Dutch study, EPEC study published in the Lancet this year, where they actually took 232 patients with cholestasis but no cholangitis. These patients did not have cholangitis. So, this is the typical situation you're looking for. They divided them into those for early ERCP and those with conservative treatment. And you can see when the major endpoint was uh, 
The primary endpoint with major complications or death, there's no difference whether you did a conservative treatment or whether you did uh, uh, aggressive ERCP. And all these patients uh, had a spintrotomy done in them, all the patients, whether they had uh, gallstones or not, had spintrotomies done in them. And you'll find that some of them developed cholangitis in this group, but 10% developed cholangitis in the conservative groups, and this were treated with ERCP. So the message from this study was that if you have a patient with a CBD stone who doesn't have cholangitis, uh, with only pancreatitis, then you need not have an urgent intervention in these patients, unless the cholestasis is producing other problems like progressively increasing bilirubin and so on. So now we have the answer for all our groups of patients. Cholangitis, urgent ERCP, no obstruction, no endoscopic intervention. In those who have a biliary pancreatic obstruction, there is no need for urgent ERCP. Now, this again is very important, the term urgent ERCP, uh, because if you look at, of course, recommendations which came later on, that uh, if you have patients with acute gallstone pancreatitis, acute severe, predicted acute severe pancreatitis uh, with, with cholangitis, then of course you do ERCP. Uh, but if those who have CBD stone, who is having increasing cholestasis and pancreatitis is deteriorating, then you may think of doing ERCP in these patients. Now, why is this timing very important? This is important because this is a very nice study which came from Argentina. We showed that if it, these patients actually had acute pancreatitis, gallstone pancreatitis, went for surgery. You see that by 24, even 48 hours, the extent of pancreatic necrosis is only 10%. But between 48 to 72 hours, it increased to 84%. So you can see this was very crucial. We always talk about doing ERCP within 72 hours, but looks like we had to do it earlier, within 48 hours. And in this, just that study, one of the differences between other studies was the ERCP was done by about 30 hours on average in all the patients, very early on. And that was, I think, very important. So this timing now becomes important and becomes, so there's been a swing in the pendulum from, uh, we should tell earlier, as quickly as possible, within six hours, then came 72 hours. And now we believe, that if you have to do an emergency ERCP in acute uh, pancreatitis with cholangitis, then I think uh, it should be within 48 hours. And it becomes important because sometimes you can't organize, if a patient comes on a Saturday with this problem, what do you do? Because the difference of doing an organized ERCP where you have your good assistant fluoroscopy, patient nicely sedated versus an emergency ERCP where you're almost alone with uh, one anesthetist sometimes can be very difficult and sometimes no anesthetist. And therefore, timing becomes very important. And in my opinion, you can be a little flexible, but it should be above 48 hours. But this is very difficult to implement in many hospitals. And the reason is that you see, this is an audit which was done among uh, British gastroenterologists when all these uh, uh, criteria came for early ERCP. And you can see that only 8.7% of people are actually doing urgent ERCP for severe pancreatitis. So even in a well-organized system, it's difficult, and you can imagine what happens in our country. Of course, there is a need for urgent ERCP in addition to gallstones in other situations. Uh, when you have a patient, of course, with cholangitis like this, you can see that what we do is a needle knife spintrotomy. We can cut open the papilla, and when you cut open the papilla, there's a tiny stone which is stuck in the tip there, and just dislodging the stone, uh, you can see a lot of pus coming out. And obviously, this patient, cholangitis is more important than pancreatitis. And relief of cholangitis was enough to uh, solve this problem. This is, again, like in a certain in our country, there may be other indications. This was a dead biliary ascariasis in the lower end of CBD. And when we did an ERCP and removed this worm, you can see the worm coming out. There was a, a lot of uh, pus came out, and patient was, again, relieved. Uh, similarly, hydrated cysts which get impacted again, require an urgent ERCP to remove this uh, cyst. And many of them, once the membrane is removed from the orifice of the papilla, you can get dramatic relief from both cholangitis and uh, pancreatitis. What are some, there are some other rare indications, and let me touch on these uh, three important areas, which has not been uh, discussed much. The first is, so if you have patients uh, who come with uh, severe pancreatitis, um, biliary pancreatitis, and then you do an ERCP with them. Uh, is it worthwhile to put in a C pancreatic stent? For example, if you have a CBD stone, you want to clear the CBD stone and leave the patient alone. But this group uh, in Hungary, 
actually ISTA was one of our students who actually did this study. Uh, randomized the patients into two, two groups. Those who did ERCP CBD clearance, other group had ERCP with PD stenting done in addition, and then followed up these patients. And this was a very interesting concept. They not only cleared the CBD, but put a PD stent. And what they found is that uh, those patients uh, who had a PD stent did much better in terms of uh, the major complications compared to those who didn't have a PD stent. So this study has to be duplicated, but if it's true, it may be worthwhile considering in patients who come with acute to severe pancreatitis, predicted severe pancreatitis with uh, uh, gallstones, and uh, you can cannulate the pancreatic duct in these patients. You can actually put a pancreatic stent at the time of ERCP. But again, as I said, this has to be confirmed. One of the things that we should not do is this, and this is patients, uh, this is a trial which was done in two or three centers. One was Dick Kozarek's uh, center, where uh, assuming that in patients with ongoing acute pancreatitis, uh, pancreatic ductal leak is the one which is causing the more ongoing problem, they put in pancreatic stents. And although this is successful, they found that 100% of the patients got infected with this. And therefore, uh, the, they did much worse than those patients who do not have stents. So, very important message in patients with acute so severe acute pancreatitis with pancreatic ductal leak. An ERCP is not indicated for bridging this leak, at least in the acute stage in the first four weeks. Uh, the third important area, again, where there's not much of discussion is in patients who have had ERCP and developed pancreatitis. Can doing an emergency pancreatic stent help in this patient? This is a very interesting study which came from Marty Freeman's unit, where they took patients who had prophylactic pancreatic stents uh, and then found that prophylactic pancreatic stent slipped away. Then they replaced it during the next ERCP. And they had four patients who also, 10 patients who had acute post ERCP pancreatitis. And all these patients, they tried to adjust the stents back to normal or put new stents. So in those patients who had post ERCP pancreatitis, within the second or third day of the pancreatitis was severe, they went and put in a pancreatic stent. And they showed dramatic uh, relief in both uh, lipase uh, in their overall well-being. Again, this is a very controversial study. has not been repeated, but uh, put for thought that in, in addition to gallstone pancreatitis, the other indication for intervention, especially putting in pancreatic stents in patients with post-ERCP pancreatitis very early on, then probably you can pre prevent severe necrotizing pancreatitis from occurring. So just to summarize uh, my thoughts and the literature that's there for last uh, 30 years, we'd say that the most important indication for ERCP is acute gallstone pancreatitis. We used to believe that it was predicted severe pancreatitis, acute pancreatitis, but now this does not seem to be more very important. What is more important central to our intervention is acute cholangitis. Whether the patient has mild pancreatitis or severe pancreatitis, if he has cholangitis, we should do an ERCP, and now we should do an endoscopic ultrasound before to confirm before doing ERCP. And ERCP has been done within 48 hours for efficacy. If there's no cholangitis, mild disease, conservative treatment. But if it's severe disease, no cholangitis, but in addition, there is CBD stones of US. Uh, and these patients are deteriorating further or if cholestasis is increasing, there may be an indication for ERCP. But again, if US shows no biliary obstruction, even if it's predicted severe pancreatitis, no ERCP should be done, it's only conservative treatment. So we're now using US very liberally in these patients. And of course, cholangitis is the main indication. I think using this, we have found that we can be uh, very effective in terms of lower risks, higher benefits for our patients. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nagi, for this uh, very interesting and uh, impressive talk, very concise and with a uh, uh, lot of algorithms. And I think it's a very good teaching uh, or learning session. Uh, there are a couple of questions, and uh, <clears throat> so Nagi, you would like to say that uh, in any patients with the biliary pancreatitis or uh, an acute pancreatitis with the suspect gallstones, will you do an EUS or not? Yes. So I think uh, now it's almost mandatory to do an EUS in these patients. Of course, in centers where EUS is not available, you can't, of course, but I think now most centers uh, where you have a significant volume of therapeutic endoscopy or endoscopic ultrasound. And I would say that it's mandatory. If you have an US in your department and don't use it for acute gallstone pancreatitis, 
this could be a malpractice okay another thing is you no know, is a very good suggestion another thing is the is that a patient there is a mild pancreatitis we generally know that ercp is recommended only for patients with severe pancreatitis uh, i mean god sons with severe pancreatitis and cholangitis there is no doubt you have to do it and patient with the biliary obstruction you do an eos and if there is stone you do an ercp no doubt but if there is a patient with the uh, gold stones and cvd is dilated but no stones and nft is abnormal what is there is the stone have been passed off yeah. in that case will you do an ercp no. the, this is again an area where earlier on we used to do ercp now we don't if you have a patient who had uh, even mild pancreatitis dilated the cvd gold stones the stone probably passed off and it's very easy you do an endoscopic ultrasound you'll get your answer for this so uh, i would not do an ercp in these patients uh, even if the cbd is dilated without evidence of either stone or sludge thank you very much sir for an excellent talk sir i uh, one uh, question and comment i think you very nicely showed that someone who doesn't have clinical or lab evidence of obstruction so that means on day 1 or day 2 there is abnormal lft i think a simple guide is that if lft is improving within 24 hours there is really no need to go in for urgent rcp is that correct or yes i think i agree with you ramon because if you don't have us also you can depend on lft and especially the enzymes sgot sgpt you will find that uh, as soon as the stone passes they dramatically come down yeah thank you and one more thing on uh, the timing of rcp will you take try to take the patient on the same day or will you try to stabilize the patient is the need in terms of if you if you definitely there is a cbd stone i'll try and do it as quickly as possible uh, because there is very good evidence in literature that earlier you do the ercp the more benefit in terms of uh, decreasing pancreatitis so i think i would say 48 hours is okay because most of uh, the units can organize a good ercp setup within 48 hours but if we can do it more quickly there are instances where we have done within Six or eight hours. As soon as, soon as the patient comes, cholangitis and US is showing a stone. We just take it off fast. Especially when the patient is in cholangitis and sepsis, I think the it's better to do it as early as possible once the patient is stabilized. Yeah, Any other comments? Only indication for ERCP is a night is a pyogenic cholangitis. That is the. Okay. Only and i think putting a pancreatic stent in the setting of an acute pancreatitis while you do an ercp i think you know we have to be very careful about that and cannot be recommended that I, i i think you know you have shown three scenarios and i think they are very very relevant they never try to inject any contrast in the pancreatic duct and you have to do a very selective cannulation when in acute pancreatitis ercp that is very important no i think that is uh, really because you start with a guide wire and never with a contrast Matt, this is a very important point. I think should emphasize to younger colleagues because I've seen many of them very enthusiastic trying to get into the pancreatic duct in acute pancreatitis. This is uh, fatal for the patients. I think we should uh, uh, try and avoid the pancreatic duct as far as possible. And also, this concept of pancreatic stenting, which initially came from Dick Ozarek and Marty Freeman's group, and all, I'm still not very sure whether we should follow that unless we have strong evidence that in post ERCP pancreatitis is going to help or in evolving uh, biliary pancreatitis i'm not sure i don't think this is this is just information i just passed on for discussion but in practice it should not be i think, I think that so. in practice now i think so. with the availability of eus i think there should not be any role for mrcp in the present days no to pick up yeah so yeah jane that's a good point because there's always this discussion on mrcp and uh, us uh, the problem is in acute pancreatitis getting good mrcp images is always a problem and especially if the stone is less than 6 mm which can often be the cause of pancreatitis you don't pick it up on mrcp plus uh, if the patient is getting uh, sedated in the same sitting us ercp can be done for all these advantages we prefer us over but if we don't have us facility and uh, then if you have mrcp in the hospital that's one of the options but generally very rarely we do that we go for us and then yeah thank you nagi we hi nagi we sometimes we use this uh, diclofenac as a rectal suppository for prophylaxis in yeah. post ercp pancreatitis in a patient who already has pancreatitis and we are doing an ercp is there any need to use that or what is your practice so this is a very good point ashok all the studies that have been done have been in uh, non ercp acute pan i mean post ercp so if patient comes to some other indication you do it but if the patient has uh, post ercp pancreatitis 
and uh, I mean for gallstone pancreatitis, we always use uh, uh, indomethacin. There's no studies to specifically see this group of patients. Indomethacin is now available, fortunately, in our country easily. There are at least two companies making them, so there's no problem. But because uh, except for renal failure, there's no other problems. You can use it freely. We tend to use it, but. Like you said, we really don't know once the onset of pancreatitis is occurred, whether it's really going to be protective. May not be, but may not be having any harm in this. Now, to the organizers, you know, is there any time for questions? There are so many other questions to um, Dr. Uh, uh, for critical care questions and also to Dr. Uh, Ashok Saluja. Any, any time left now? So I think we can have two, three, four minutes. Okay. Dr. Saluja is here. You can direct questions to him or Dr. Rajeshwari. She's also here, but I think well, let's wind it up in about five minutes or so. Yeah. See, Dr. Dadiashini, there is a question that what is the role of uh, estimating serum lactate and how, uh, how is really connected with the morbidity or any clinical significance uh, on that? And how frequently you should do that, doing a lactate? Serum lactate is a very uh, sensitive uh, indicator of tissue perfusion. So uh, in a patient who's got a low uh, cardiac output state-like uh, situation, supposing a patient is on high-dose vasopressors, we normally do a serum lactate uh, serially. So uh, if the serum lactates are very high, we might uh, repeat it twice a day, but it's a very good indicator of improvement or deterioration in the situation anyways. So uh, along, especially a patient who's... Uh, not whose perfusion status is not known and who's on high dose vasopressors who shows evidence of metabolic acidosis, serum lactates must be done. So they give us an idea of whether we are on the right path or not. Another question to uh, Dr. Ashok Saluja is that uh, there are different causes for acute pancreatitis, you now ranging from uh, drug induced, the biliary obstruction, alcohol, and even uh, cannabis, and so many things uh, uh, like uh, hypertriglyceridemia, hypercalcemia. So all this, the pathogenesis, is it same or do you think it is different? But the the um, initiation is same or different? I, I think it's a, it's a good question. By and large, in uh, most every uh, pancreatitis, you know, depending upon the etiology, you know, different. The initial events are same. I, I think there are two overriding events. One is you know, uh, intraacinal cell activation of trypsinogen to trypsin, which then cause activation of other things and, and cell death, early necrosis, early, but the part then, then the second part is the inflammatory markers. And, and I, I think the problem is that that inflammation is a very wide area. And a lot of that we still don't understand, not only in pancreas, but in every other disease. The good example right now is COVID. COVID is a lot of inflammation. We cannot control it. That's why we have a lot of patients, like, you know, I'm just looking at it in US, like we have 240,000 lives lost. If we had a control of inflammation, there will be less. Same is true for pancreatitis, and it really does not matter what form of, you know, what, what etiology is. Uh, obviously, the, you know, the triggering event is different. There are different receptors, different things. But eventually, I think so far, everything we have studied is the calcium goes up, you know, and at least in most etiologies, trypsin is in acute pancreatitis. Not, maybe not in chronic, but in acute pancreatitis, trypsin is activated. In chronic story is a little bit different, there, I think we can get pancreatitis even without at all activation of uh, trypsin, uh, active trypsin, because we have these trypsin knockout mice which don't get any chronic, which get as much chronic pancreatitis as wild type. So indicating that trypsin may not be the most crucial part in chronic, but in acute, events are same. The floor is open for uh, organizers now. That's true. Pramod, Nagi, and Sudipta. Uh, again, to Ashok, I don't know whether you can hear me. Ashok? Yes, I'm here, Nagi. So, the, the reason I was, I, this is very peculiar that in COVID, for example, we know these inflammatory markers are similar to what's happening in pancreatitis in terms of uh, IL 6 and all those things. But uh, steroids are definitely being shown to be useful, at least when used in the second week of uh, the DEXA study and all. But in, in pancreatitis, we know very clearly that uh, steroids are absolutely, I mean, not useful in acute pancreatitis, especially second week we're starting. So what's the difference 
why this uh, difference to inflammatory pathology in both these conditions? I, I think, and again, I mean, I, I can't claim expertise in that, although steroids certainly are very effective. And obviously, Trump took steroid and he got, he thinks he got better. But <laughs> maybe he got better physically, not mentally, but that's a different story, right? I, I think his mental setup got worse after steroids. But um, that was a joke, okay. So, so but, but I, I really think, I think part of the reason, part of the reasons in my mind is that uh, the, the uh, time, timing, like in pancreatitis, I think the, uh, most of the inflammatory markers start activating or are become, a, you know, really very pronounced very early. I think within hours or within a day, Whereas in COVID, it's probably is quite late event in that, right? As you mentioned, it's like but probably at least week. So I, you know. That may be there. But Ashok, uh, in post-ERCP pancreatitis, there have been trials using steroids very early. In fact, uh, just immediately after the onset, which is equivalent to what they're doing in COVID. Still, they're not been shown to be used. If I have to conjecture and make a guess, which I don't have, because I, it could be that in pancreatitis, obviously we know IL-6 and IL-1 are these things, but my always problem with these inflammatory markers are there are so many of them. In pancreatitis, I mean, one goes up, then comes down, the second one is up, third one is down, and it's just, it's very, very, um, you know, there's abundance of that and compensatory response. Maybe in COVID, it's probably only like, you know, IL-6 and two or three others which are important, which can be controlled with steroids. Whereas in, I, has there been a study, which I'm not familiar, where you give uh, steroid and see most of the inflammatory markers are down, like IL-6 and post-ERCP are in pancreatitis down? I, I'm, I'm sure someone must have done this study. I'm not familiar with it. Uh, so they have just looked at the clinical situation after ERCP and, and showed that uh, using steroids versus no steroids didn't make a difference. But uh, they haven't gone really day-to-day -day, uh, using uh, all these cytokines and so on. Right. Nagi, in that respect, you know, even corticosteroids is found to be a reason for pancreatitis. You know, corticotherapy can actually induce uh, pancreatitis. No, so that's actually the. There are, uh, there are some controversies on that, narcotic cell and pancreatitis. And another thing, Nagi, is that uh, in, in COVID, uh, at least most of the COVID studies I know, in, you know and, and uh, also I think with, with my own family members in India who got COVID, you give them so many different things simultaneously. So I'm not sure that, that there's a study where you give just, co, uh, you know, uh, steroids alone and nothing else and see the effect of that. I, I, I don't think anyone is doing that. So, so when you give five different things, you, you really don't know which one is effective and which one is not. And then what dose of steroids is effective is still, uh, you know, open question. Sudipta? Unmute. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. On behalf of the Indian Bankers Club, I would like to express our sincere thanks to all faculty members who have taken time from the busy schedule. Uh, Dr. Saluja from abroad, Dr. Nagiredi, Dr. Jayanti, Dr. Matthew Thalet, Dr. Rajeshwari, Dr. Ashok Chako, and of course, Dr. Pramod Garg for having uh, taken part in this webinar. We've had a wonderful session today, uh, and we have had almost 300 plus viewers who have logged in from different parts of the world. And uh, through the course of lectures, I'm very sure that it has helped both the teachers as well as the students in understanding how to manage acute pancreatitis in the first few weeks. We are looking forward to our next webinar on the 21st of November at the same time between 6 and 8 p.m., in which we would focus on the management of acute pancreatitis in the third and fourth week. Thank you, everybody, for taking part in this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sudipta, for an excellent show. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody.
good day to all thank, thank you so much thank you for the kind invitation right. and i think you know we should not also give the youtube link for uh, students to follow it up it's actually really good uh, sessions and excellent talks absolutely thank you absolutely right thank you thank you nice thank interaction, you. Right. Nice interaction. Nice interaction right. with dr alux uh, ashok saluja and i i know that very early morning there now thank you so much thank you thank you thank you dr phillips and